the hearing is coming to order. Good morning, everyone. I am Council Member Alika Ampre Samuel and Chair of the Committee on Public Housing. I just want to let everyone know that there are a few other hearings that are taking place right now. The Health Committee is meeting and the Sanitation Committee is meeting. And so I will have Council Members join throughout this proceeding. We are here today to conduct an oversight hearing on property management in NYCHA. Specifically, I am referring to matters related to property management and managers delegated to each housing development who are charged by NYCHA with the responsibility to oversee development cleanliness, staffing, property budgets, maintenance repairs, resident complaints, rent collection, and independent contractors. NYCHA is home to some 400,000 residents, 176,066 apartment units, 2,462 buildings, and 326 developments throughout the five boroughs, and is the largest public housing authority in North America. In my district alone, the 41st Council District, I represent 26 developments and have the, high, have the largest concentration of public housing in the New York City Council. That said, NYCHA has a huge responsibility in making sure that management systems optimize efficiencies currently set in place, continue to research, develop, and implement best practices to increase effectiveness and to ensure the health, well-being, and safety of all of its residents. Three years ago, the mayor and outgoing NYCHA chair, Shola Olatier, unveiled the newest strategy to deliver long-needed improvements to residents' quality of life called Next Generation NYCHA, a comprehensive 10-year plan to change the way NYCHA is funded and managed. Since the introduction of Next Gen NYCHA, numerous pilot programs have been introduced to revamp the way NYCHA runs its developments. Let NYCHA tell it, these changes have been resounding and successful. But to many residents, they tell a different story. They've told us that even with the changes, NYCHA's management systems may have failed to keep mold out of their homes, some management have failed to keep lead paint off their walls, and in the dead of winter, management failed to keep the heat on. But to its credit, NYCHA recognizes that it must provide better customer service and property management for its residents. Reorganizing its management model is both necessary and NYCHA seen as an urgent matter. But in order to make positive and lasting change, we need to know what works and what does not work. There are great property managers, and this hearing is not about them. In fact, I applaud them. I am here today gathering information on behalf of all of our constituents and residents living in NYCHA who deserve answers, improvement on efficiencies, greater accountability, effective project management, and decent homes to live in and raise a family. Today's hearing will allow the council and the public to learn more about the problems that may plague NYCHA and the programs that have been implemented to combat them. Notably, through its Next Generation Operations Model, previously known as OpMom, or the Optimal Property Management Operating Model, this program allowed project managers, property managers, to make decisions regarding maintenance and repair issues. More specifically, the program gave property managers a budget and the very unique and crucial authority con to contract out for work. Today, we will also discuss NYCHA's implemented Flex Ops pilot program, which gave maintenance workers greater elasticity in addressing maintenance issues so that residents could expect attention to needed repairs outside of the hours of 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Flex Ops allow properties to operate from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays, thereby extending hours of operation to complete routine repairs. Due to the positive feedback, NYCHA has extended services in this program through September of 2019. NYCHA has decentralized decision-making at some of its developments, 
and this hearing will allow council members and the public to learn about the benefits and the challenges of these models. With that said, I thank NYCHA for joining us today and look forward to working collaboratively with NYCHA to apply the lessons learned today across the developments and ensure that management is effective and accountable to the residents. At this time, I will administer the affirmation. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the committee and respond honestly to council members' questions? Okay, thank you. And General Manager Vito Masachulo, you can begin. Thank you very much and good morning. Uh, Chair Emperor Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing. Good morning, my name is Vito Mustachulo and I am NYCHA's new General Manager. Um, I am pleased to be joined this morning by Kathy Pennington, Executive Vice President of Operations, and, and Carolyn Jasper, who is a newly named Vice President um, for Public Housing Operations. And I, I wanna just point out for a second, uh, Carolyn, uh, who has a, a distinguished career with NYCHA. I'm um, starting in 1987, um, when she was only five years old. Um, and, and Carolyn has worked in almost all um, five boroughs with the exception of one. Uh, but Carolyn comes to us with a, uh, an incredible amount of experience um, and expertise. And, and I just thank her very much for accepting her new role. Uh, and we look forward to moving forward with Carolyn uh, and, and Kathy um, in operations. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for being here. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity to discuss um, this very important issue um, regarding the maintenance and repair of the homes of hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who live in public housing and, and how we provide that vital service um, and, and offer our residents many pathways for um, opportunities. Um, uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Kathy, um, you know, I would also like to point out um, and, and to mention a few other folks that are here today and my apologies if I fail to recognize anyone, uh, but we have resident, we have RA presidents, um, and we have um, property managers from developments, um, and I'm going to name just a few, uh, from Wrangell, from Highland, from Dykeman, from Grant, from Astoria, um, from Frederick Samuels. I wanna thank them all for being here today. Uh, I think it's extremely um, important, and it shows the, um, how much importance this hearing is for all of us and that they're all here today. Um, I've seen a number of the resident, uh, the presidents. Um, I've been out to about 30 or so developments. I've met a number of them. Um, and there really is um, an incredible collegial um, support that we're receiving. Now, I also want to recognize uh, the president of CCOP, Danny Barber, who's here as well. Um, Danny's sitting off to the side somewhere, but I wanted to thank him for being here um, as well. Um, and I can't thank you enough for your support. Uh, this is a new role for both of us. Um, uh, but we've had some, some great conversations. Um, the questions that you have asked of us um, are important questions, um, and it's, it's helpful. Um, it's helpful to hear a different perspective. Um, so again, I thank you for your support. I thank you for holding this hearing today. Um, through Next Generation NYCHA, our long-term strategic plan, we are strengthening our organization and striving to become more efficient and effective, delivering quality property management and repair services to all of our residents. Uh, with that, that really concludes my opening statement. I'd like to turn over the rest of the testimony to Kathy Pennington. Thank you, General Manager Mustacello. Before I go into details about property management and NYCHA, it's helpful to discuss the authority size and scope and how it's organized. Um, as mentioned, NYCHA operates 175,000 apartments in more than 2,400 buildings in 325 developments in every borough that are home to about 400,000 New Yorkers. NYCHA's workforce totals more than 10,800 full-time employees, nearly a quarter of whom are residents of NYCHA and about two-thirds of whom work in operations, providing services for our residents. We currently have more than 250 property managers and assistant managers responsible for the overall operation of developments, more than 300 property maintenance superintendents and assistant superintendents who strive to keep our developments clean and in good condition, over 400 housing assistants who help residents with administrative matters, about 3,000 caretakers who clean floors, take out trash, and maintain grounds, 
nearly 800 maintenance workers who perform basic repair, and more than 1,000 staff who work in 25 different skilled trades, which include carpenters, painters, plasters, plumbers, glaziers, electricians, exterminators, roofers, and more. Several members of the operations property management team are here today. All of our portfolio directors are, have joined us today. I'd like to acknowledge them. Director, stand. Wait, stand up. These are, these are the men and women who run our day-to-day -day operations throughout our six portfolios um, within the city. Thank you. Right now, there are 7,000 plus colleagues are working to ensure safe, clean, and con connected homes for our residents. The operations team is truly the backbone of this agency, and I'd like to thank them for their dedication to the NYCHA community. I would also like to thank our residents in attendance today to speak about how they work with our property management staff. Property management at NYCHA does not take a one-size-fits-all approach. Our developments range in size from nearly 2,200 units at Baruch Houses in Manhattan to 13 units at College Point Rehab in Queens. We have buildings that exclusively house seniors and others that serve working families. More than two-thirds of NYCHA's residents are seniors and children under the age of 18. We also provide housing to veterans and formerly homeless households. We have developments at the easternmost edge of Queens, along Coney Island Channel in Brooklyn, and in the northern Bronx near the border of Westchester County. Our developments are divided into six portfolios, and those were the directors that, that we acknowledged, each with a director and several regional asset managers, or RAMs. This management team leads our property management staff in addressing challenges, improving operations, and providing quality customer service to our residents. Our developments are led by a property manager, along with property maintenance superintendents, supervisors of grounds and caretakers, maintenance staff, and housing assistants. The staffing structure varies depending on the size of each development. The amount of staff varies as well and is based on the number of units at each development and our available budget. For instance, the budget allows one caretaker for every 57 units and one maintenance worker for every 224 units. This property management team is responsible for many different functions at our developments, including routine maintenance of grounds and buildings, including trash management, routine apartment inspections and basic repairs and units, coordination of move-outs and new rentals, including preparing vacant units for residents and conducting rental interviews, administration and enforcement of leases, including working with residents delinquent on rent, appearing in court, and assisting residents with annual reviews. Communication with resident association leaders, local NYPD precincts, elected officials, and other members of the community, and making resident referrals to programs that bolster self-sufficiency and other vital resources. In addition to staff based at the developments, NYCHA's skilled trade staffs, plumbers, plaster, roofers, and others, serve all developments in a portfolio. Our planning units with development, our planning units work with developments to schedule skilled trade work. This is a complex job because one repair, such as a leaky pipe, involves multiple skilled trades. Additionally, our support services team maintains building systems, such as heating plants and elevators, and responds to after-hours emergencies. Here are some examples of what our property management skilled trades and support services team accomplished last year. Responded to 2.7 million maintenance and repair requests, including 386,000 after-hours or emergency repairs conducted nearly 2,000 boiler inspections, and completed 4,800 boiler repairs. Maintained over 3,200 elevators, which make over 3 million trips a day and a billion trips a year. Conducted more than 48,000 routine apartment inspections, completing nearly 70,000 work orders generated by those inspections. Signed leases with 4,000 new households completed nearly 142,000 annual reviews and liaised with more than 250 resident associations. NextGen Operations, or NGO, is a new 
localized property management model that puts more control over decision making in the hands of property managers, those who know the needs of their developments best. Launched in 2015 as the Optimal Property Management Operating Model, or OPMOM, the NGO model is now in place at 129 developments and we plan to roll it out to all developments by mid-2019. Through NGO, property managers are empowered to independently make decisions that affect their developments. They have more control over their budgets and can make decisions about purchasing without going to central office, resulting in faster and better service for residents. NGO sites can use their budgets to create model buildings, upgrading and renovating common area spaces to make them more welcoming to residents. Before a development moves to the NGO model of property management, staff are required to take courses on subjects such as budget management, property maintenance, and customer service. More than 800 property management staff have been trained and remaining staff are scheduled to complete training over the next year. Before we launched Next Generation um, NYCHA, Basic repairs took an average of 13 days to complete. We've brought that number down to four days across the portfolio. At our NGO developments, basic repairs are completed even faster in 3.6 days. NGO sites complete emergency repairs and apartment turnovers about 20% faster than non-NGO sites, and they have approximately 15% fewer open work orders. NGO is just one way that we are making progress. We have launched a number of other initiatives to improve customer service and quality of life for residents. We're, we're stretching our limited dollars to get more work done by increasing staff's ability to use contracts for specific ser services such as painting, compactor chute cleaning, and exterior lighting repairs. The goal is to reduce work order backlog, increase timely response to repairs, and provide greater flexibility to focus on what is most urgent. As part of our commitment to enhanced routine cleaning, staff at our developments are covering more ground literally using new efficient floor cleaning machines. We've equipped employees with smartphones, enabling them to open and close work orders while getting residents sign off on the work. Those are all depicted in the, in the pictures here. Through our development-based skilled trades initiative, we are testing a model that assigns skilled trades, carpenters, plasters, painters, to specific developments. This allows developments to do their own scheduling for these trades rather than working with the central borough office. The goal is to make scheduling and assignment of the trades more efficient, ultimately cutting down on repair times. We've streamlined the process for creating work orders for court-ordered repairs so that this important work can be completed faster. We installed digital kiosks at every property management office, enabling residents to take advantage of NYCHA's online services such as paying rent, requesting repairs, and recertifying income. Through new interactive tools on our website, residents and the public can track NYCHA's progress on repairs and construction. The Flexible Operations Program, or FlexOps, is another way we are improving quality of life for residents. NYCHA is a 24-7 operation, but it is run from 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Monday through Friday, unlike most private landlords. As a departure from that model, FlexOps enhances service delivery through expanded staggered work shifts. Launched in 2016, FlexOps is now at 11 consolidations. The initiative provides more flexibility for employees, for residents, it provides cleaner buildings and after-hour meetings with property management. In surveys conducted last fall, 18% more residents rated their building conditions as excellent, very good, or good since FlexOps was implemented at their development. Property management staff are our ambassadors, and they play a critical role in making sure residents are aware of and connected to our programs and services available through NYCHA and our partners. For example, staff use our web-based referral system to connect residents to financial counseling when they need help with budgeting in order to pay their rent. They work with our community and senior center sponsors on health and recreational resources for residents and they participate in resident-led development projects that improve the quality of life for all residents. Our three digital vans travel the city providing residents internet access and technology 
to search and apply for jobs, complete schoolwork, and access government resources. We acknowledge that there is more work to be done to provide residents the quality of life they deserve, but it must be noted that we are operating under significant constraints. Our buildings are old and deteriorating. The majority of them are more than a half century old. At the same time, we have been shortchanged $3 billion in federal operating and capital funding since 2001 to address our aging properties, vast maintenance and repair needs. However, our mayor and council recognize the importance of preserving and strengthening public housing, and we thank you for your unprecedented and continued support. As I step into this new role, I'm looking at NYCHA's operational challenges with a fresh lens, trying to get to the bottom of our most persistent problems so that we can identify effective and practical ways to improve. Our goal is to provide quality customer service to residents. While many staff at NYCHA excel at customer service, going the extra mile for residents every day, we acknowledge that maintaining consistently high levels of customer service across the authority is an area we must improve. While we have a system in place for tracking the requests and status of maintenance and repairs, we recognize that there are gaps in our process that lead to complaints of work not being completed or repairs taking too long to complete. Our data show that sometimes repairs are not made because a resident is not at home when staff arrives to make repairs. We can improve this through better communication with residents about scheduling and by holding staff accountable to demonstrate that they went to the apartment at the scheduled time. A related challenge is improving communication with residents about the status of repairs. When a maintenance worker schedules a skilled trade such as a plumber to complete a repair, the resident may not be informed that the next repair job has been scheduled. Compounding this problem is the fact that it often takes a number of weeks before a skilled trade repair can be scheduled due to a shortage of staffing and an extensive backlog of work orders. We are all dismayed by the reports of unacceptable apartment conditions. Residents living with holes in their walls that haven't been repaired or repair jobs that are half finished. Often these situations occur because of the shortage of skilled trade staff available to finish the repairs and the challenge of scheduling multiple trades for one repair. For example, repair of a leak in the wall requires coordination with a number of different staff maintenance worker to confirm the leak and identify the source, a plumber to fix the leak, a plasterer to repair the wall, and a painter to paint the newly plastered wall. To put this problem in perspective, right now we have a backlog of 32,000 paint jobs, 24,000 carpentry jobs. Put another way, each month on average, an average of 16,200 work orders requiring plumbers, plasters, and carpenters are created. But due to our staffing levels, we're only able to complete approximately 15,600 of those. One of our goals is to reduce this backlog and improve the timeliness of complex repairs. However, when repairs are made, our quality insurance inspections show that about 95% are done satisfactorily. And last year, we responded to nearly 2.7 million work orders, including about 169,000 paint and 66,000 plaster work orders. Decades of underfunding has meant decades of deferred maintenance and investment in our buildings, resulting in enormous capital needs. That makes repairs more complex, costly, and time-consuming. We also face challenges stemming from repeat vandalism of doors and elevators. Trash management is another major issue at many of our developments, and we are working to find effective solutions that will keep our developments clean and cut down on the amount of time staff spend dealing with trash-related problems. We appreciate the support from the city that is enabling us to address some of these issues. These are just a, f a few of the areas we plan to focus on, though we recognize we have many other challenges affecting our residents' quality of life. We must strive to be a more efficient landlord and focus on providing quality customer service to our residents. To that end, we are rolling out NGO to all of our developments, piloting flex ops at select developments, 
using contract services to get more work done, and evaluating our development-based skilled trades pilot. We are reviewing our policy and procedures related to work orders and communications with residents with a goal of reducing the number of work orders closed without work being done. After this winter's heating crisis, we are undertaking a comprehensive assessment of our heating operations, our procedures related to maintenance and outages, our staffing and our use of data to inform planning and preventative maintenance. Thank you, Kathy. Sorry. Thank you, Kathy. Kathy. Property management is our core business. Under Next Gen NYCHA and with Next Gen Operations, we are working to improve residents' quality of life with more efficient repairs and connections to invaluable services. However, the steady, decades long decline in federal funding imperils our work and the progress we're making. Please stand with us as we continue advocating for the increased operating funding NYCHA desperately needs from Washington. Again, thank you for your support as we create safe, clean, and connected communities. We want to continue the dialogue on how we can work together to best serve our residents. And we are now happy to answer any questions that you and the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your testimony. Um, we have been joined by the council's majority leader, Councilwoman Lori Cumbo, and we were just joined by um, <coughs> Council Member Reverend Ruben oh. Diaz Sr. from the Bronx. So again, I just want to um, reiterate that the focus of this hearing is um, predominantly not just about um, property management, but the NGO program in particular, because it's within 129 developments with the goal to be rolled out by mid-2019 um, across the entire um, portfolio for all developments. So the focus will be on um, really diving into the NGA program and what's happening, um, is it working, is it not working? So the series of questions um, will be just focused on um, NGO. So with that, you have over 250 property managers and 129 developments are within the NGO program. How many property managers are managing properties within NGO? It would be the 129. Nine. 129. 129. So that means that, so it's not like it's a, um, some like scatter sites or developments that may have more, um, more developments where there's one property manager for maybe three different developments? Is it a 129 property managers for all 129 developments? Well, some of those developments are consolidation, so they may be more than one property within it. But it would be the 129 that are in the program. Okay. So what are the training requirements for property managers within the NGO program? So the training um, includes budget management, property maintenance, uh, customer service are three core areas. Um, and the length of the training is that the regional asset managers go to 12 days of training. The development and super supervisory staff go to about 20 days of training and the supervisors of grounds and caretakers receive 10 days of training, and housing assistants receive five days of training. So the training is very extensive and really is kind of an A to Z training on the foundation of property management. While many of our, our staff are experienced, we took this as an opportunity to reset our standards on property management you know, incorporating industry standards uh, in affordable housing into our training. So we think it's a very robust and comprehensive training. Okay, can you explain the difference again between the RAMs and the actual property managers and how um, their role um, plays out in how they manage the, like the actual property managers? Can you explain that dynamic? And then explain the differences in um, the trainings between the two the RAMs overall and the property managers or the folks that are actually on the ground in the devel individual developments? Okay, so um, the portfolios, some of them are, are designed by um, a borough. So for instance, 
in Manhattan, we have a borough director, and then the borough director has anywhere from three to four regional asset managers. And each regional asset manager is responsible for a select number of properties. Um, that regional a asset manager's role is to work closely with the property manager to provide strategic planning and support. So in, in other words, it's like being a super coach. That um, regional asset manager is trying to work with that property manager on specific goals for each of their properties mm -hmm. in areas that require improvement, whether it be on service delivery, whether it be on customer service, completion of annual recertifications. There's a number of indicators that we measure each property on, um, the length of time it takes to prepare a unit for turnover. So we have a number of metrics that each property has to achieve and the RAM's role is to work with the properties to address any obstacles that are in the way to coach their performance um, for the properties. Okay, who conducts the training? The training is conducted by a number of uh, external training organizations. NARO uh, is one organization, Nan McKay is another. We've contracted for that uh, professional training services. I think there's a third, I can't remember who it is. Okay, and is there an average salary for the property managers? Um, there is an average salary. I don't have that before me, but I can certainly get that for you. And is this a union position? Yes, it or is. Or managerial? A yes. union position? Which union? Yeah, we're getting that information. It's Teamsters Local 237. Yeah, sorry, the managers fall under Teamsters Local 237. Okay. And on average, how long does a property manager stay within NYCHA? And on average, how long do they stay within the development where they actually are assigned? We'll have to, unless you do you have a sense? Okay. Well, to give um, an exact amount of years that a property manager stays with the nature, that can vary because what happens is that, you know, through the, through a housing manager's career, they come up the ranks. So they may start at, uh, as a housing assistant, an assistant manager, then rise through the ranks to become a property manager. So, you know, many of our housing managers have been around for many years. You may have had managers who have been managers, say, perhaps for 10, 15 years or longer. So at this point, um, I don't have the average number of years for the managers, but that's something that we can get back to you on. Okay. And what about within the development that they are assigned? Well, within a development, that can also vary as well. Um, we've had managers that may have been at property, say, for maybe two years to five years to seven years. But again, it varies. Sometimes, you know, you need to change managers because of different dynamics, you know. Um, you know, many times, you know, um, I was a director myself, and in looking at the different skills that a manager possesses, they may be stronger, you know, we may need a a manager who has stronger, say, skills to manage a larger property. So, you know, that's an assessment that the borough director, you know, will have to make to see, well, you know, is, you know, is it the time to transfer a property manager? But again, you know, it varies based on different reasons. Okay. And I just want to announce we've been joined by council members Donovan <coughs> Richards as well as council member um, Salamanca. Council member, I have the answer on the salary. Oh, okay. Uh, the base or entry level salary is 52289 right. And we can get back to you with the average salary. Okay. Um, you mentioned um, the property managers and if there um, may be some dynamics mm -hmm. within the development where they may have to uh, move to a different yes. development. If there's an instance where there's ongoing complaints against a particular property manager, mm -hmm. um, what happens to them? Um, like ongoing complaints from constituents. Okay. okay. If there are ongoing complaints against the manager, again, you know, as the borough director, the regional asset manager, we have to, you know, make an assessment as to what the complaints are, look into the nature of the complaints. 
Um, you know, sometimes uh, if you have, if we receive multiple complaints, it may not be of our best interest to just transfer the manager. We need to deal with the situation or with the issue at hand. Because, you know, if we transfer a manager from one property, we're just transferring, say, an issue from one property to the next property. So again, based on the nature of the complaint, if we do find that there are issues where, um, say, the property manager or staff, you know, they're not performing up to par, then it's up to us, to property management or to the, uh, the responsibility of the regional asset manager to start progressive disciplinary action. And disciplinary action is not to, say, terminate you know, an employee's um, uh, employment, but it's corrective action. So we're looking to correct the action. Okay. We have Councilmember, I'm sorry, I would just like to add though, um, that the property manager is just one piece of the component. Right, it's one person, uh, there's an entire team that supports each of the developments. Um, so we really do, when we receive complaints, when we receive information, um, we have to look at the, to the totality. Um, it might not just be the property manager, um, it could mean that we need to put additional resources into that particular development. Right? Um, so there's a much larger team, uh, the property manager is the person that represents the development and they are charged with a lot of responsibilities. Uh, but I just want to be clear that, that there are other factors that we do need to take into consideration. Okay, so um, when you walk into an average development um, property management office, who will you see besides the property manager since there are other people who actually work there? So who else is in the building well, within the management staff, the administrative staff in the office? When an individual first uh, comes into the property management office, they will be greeted by a receptionist, right? Thereafter, um, each resident is assigned to a housing assistant. So the next line of command after seeing the receptionist would be their housing assistant. So thereafter, some management offices have assistant property managers, and uh, of course, you have a housing manager. So again, based on the nature of the complaint, if the resident has made, say, an appointment to see the manager, or if there is, say, a critical issue that needs to be uh, addressed by the manager, they will speak with the receptionist regarding their issue. I might add that one piece that um, is uh, somewhat challenging, there's a lot of interdependencies as the GM was mentioning. So the property manager is ultimately responsible, but the, the, the team has to deliver. So for instance, the skilled trades that we talked about, all those trades, those 23 different trades, those services are all scheduled and coordinated outside of the site-based property management. So the property manager is dependent on their borough or their portfolio skilled trade unit. So we have individual units that do all the work around planning for getting, making sure the staff have the right materials to do the jobs and then all the scheduling. So, so sometimes there could be dissatisfaction on the service side that you know, may be dependent on, on another unit. So it's just to, to kind of make that point about some of our interdependencies. Okay. We've been also joined by Council Member Joe Nye. Um, just along the same lines, you mentioned, and then I'll, this will be my last question, and I'll open it up to my colleagues. Um, so under Next Gen Operations, the property manager has a budget and the authority to contract work. Um, what criteria does NYCHA use to determine the budget for each development? And can you provide us with a breakdown of um, how that money is allocated to each development within the program? So uh, there's a budget season we go through, which is in the fourth quarter of each year. And this is just my first round with it. But uh, each property manager is doing an assessment along with their RAM, their regional asset manager, to look at what that property needs. So they may be looking at their history of work orders, uh, what types of services were in demand in the past year, where they might see some backlogs and they might need additional services. They also are going to be anticipating our annual HUD inspections, which we refer to as FAS inspections, and they need to prepare. There are certain standards we must meet at our properties each year for the HUD inspections. So those are the kind of um, data they would pull on what's happened in the past year at the property, where the backlogs are, and then they would build their, what we refer to as their services and supplies budget. And each property has an individual budget. Okay. 
Okay, so I, I have a series of other questions, but right now I will open it up to my colleagues. And the first will be Majority Leader Combo. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you all for being here today. Wanted to jump right in into the issue around staffing. So in the testimony, it states that there are 10,800 full-time employees, um, nearly a quarter of whom are residents. Why is that number so low that there's only a quarter of whom are residents? And in addition to that, how many of those staff members are administrative versus those that work in the other categories such as property managers, maintenance superintendents, basically people that are in the field? How many are administrative and how many um, are actually working within the NYCHA um, grounds? Sure, so I, I can start with that. Um, so of the uh, 10,200 full-time employees, mm -hmm. um, operations, um, there are about 7,200 of those 10,200 that work in operations. Okay. So the balance are other support services, other programs. Because in, a, in addition to that, I understand that you're going to be uh, downsizing your staffing dramatically. So it says NYCHA's 2018 five-year operating plan shows that NYCHA plans to reduce the administrative headcount by 444 employees. So there has been a concerted effort on the part of NYCHA um, to reduce the number of administrative and support staff and to focus our, our um, staffing levels um, on the front line, um, on the maintenance staff and operations. Is it thought that the 444 employees, that would be administrative, but is it thought that there is perhaps right now a lot of employees who are not being effectively utilized or? So I'm going to actually ask uh, Kerry Jew, Executive Vice President for Administration, to come up and- I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Um, so the, the four- and Could you tell me your name again? I'm sorry. Kerry Jew. Okay. Okay, so the, um, the proposed downsizing is in- Oh, we have to do a swearing? Oh. Okay, we're gonna just do a swearing okay. very quickly. Raise your hand. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Thank you. So the proposed reduction in headcount is of our central office headcount. So when you're speaking of administrative staff in the property, we count them as our frontline staff. So we're not talking about reducing the office staff in, in the properties. You're not talking about reducing the office staff. That are in the property. So when you go into a property, there's, a, there's an office. And so those staff are still considered part of our front line. They provide a direct service to our residents. So where will the reduction happen? Those are in our central office. So those are, are people who work in departments like mine, administration, um, some of my colleagues here, IT, um, uh, you know, finance. What is the thought process behind that? Is that, that those that, that staff is no longer necessary or you have other ways to compensate for it or was that a large part of the challenges with NYCHA's budget is that they were too administrative or top heavy and they want to reduce um, those salaries to reduce the budget. So if I can start and then I'll turn it back over to Carrie. Uh, so w we've made a number of, um, of investments in new technology Right, um, looking at business practices, um, streamlining procedures, and, and a lot of the investments that we've made, especially on the IT side, um, have resulted in our dependency on staff. Um, so for instance, in Kerry's area, um, we're automating a lot of, of our administrative um, personnel um, work, um, which means that we don't need as many staff to actually process um, our personnel, um, the, the paperwork that's involved in, in maintaining 10,200 staff. Because what we want to make sure is, with the challenges, we want to make sure that the reduction in, in staffing is not going to further challenge uh, issues that residents have, but at the same time, we also don't want a budget 
where there are people that uh, have inefficiencies in terms of how the actual organization um, is operating. No, we, we agree 100 percent, and, and any reductions in staff um, don't happen until we actually have a, a more efficient process to, to replace those staff. Okay. Um, we're definitely going to be uh, watching that as well. NYCHA is facing additional outside oversight from the state. How will NYCHA share responsibilities with new independent monitors and analysts? So we're hearing a lot in terms of uh, state control, city control. Um, where is NYCHA in its understanding and how will they respond uh, to both entities? So um, I'm not sure about the city um, oversight, but with respect to um, the executive order signed by the governor mm -hmm. um, and the appointment of uh, an, an emergency manager, um, we're still evaluating um, exactly what that means. Um, the language was um, a bit of a surprise to us. This is unique. We've never seen language like this before. Um, so it's a precedent setter. Um, so we're still trying to evaluate exactly what that means um, for us operationally. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, unfortunately, I don't have an, an exact answer as to how mm -hmm. um, that will affect us uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. and, and wanted to segue into that. So many of my constituents speak to me. I also have employees that live in NYCHA. And as best as I can see it, many of the NYCHA residents are paying very good rent. So they're paying quite a bit. Um, to live in NYCHA, and somewhat of the understanding from the outside would make it appear as if NYCHA residents aren't actually paying, um, in some instances, a top dollar as far as living in that particular development, right? So my question is, how much rent is a part of the percentage of the operation of NYCHA? And what is the average rent of a resident in NYCHA currently? So uh, the rent billed uh, to residents is over a billion dollars, and so it is a, a significant part of our operating budget. What, what percentage is that? Of the total budget? I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't know right offhand. I would like to know that because it's important because when we're talking so much about subsidy and the federal government and why residents can't get the repairs that they need. Um, with any other type of development, you would understand that if you're paying your rent on a regular basis, that those would be funds that would be somewhat sufficient in order to manage a lot of the uh, repairs that are needed. So for, I believe, one of my staffers, they may be paying upwards of fifteen to $1,700 a month in rent. So when you're paying that type of rent, you're expecting that you're going to get premium services in terms of um, how your um, repairs are going to be made. Well, my comment would be that the rent that is charged is based on the household's income mm -hmm. at 30 percent of their income. So, you know, the higher the, the person's income, because we don't have a cap on how much a family can, can earn who lives in public housing, um, that's proportionate to what they would be paying. But at this time, you don't know what percentage of the of NYCHA's operating budget comes from rent. I, I, I can get that information for you. I would appreciate that information, but I would appreciate that information before the hearing ends. Okay. Right. Um, so I'm sorry, Council Member. Um, so the average rent that a NYCHA resident pays is $525 a month? $525? Right. And we'll get back to you with the additional um, answers to your questions. Um, I. I I did read a report and the data was from a few years back, um, but it was kind of telling that 74% that of all New York City residents um, that pay less than $500 a month uh, live in public housing. Mm -hmm. right. Do you know what that is on the high end in terms of what residents could be like? What is the high end of that? Again, we'll get back to you with the specifics okay. of the, the rent and, and the collections. I appreciate that because it's it just seems like a lot is not adding up in terms of what the residents are paying, the repairs that they need to have made, and residents still expected to pay their rent without the repairs being made. Um, one of the major issues that's uh, happening in my district, of course, is the issue around mold and moisture. Are you at this time uh, committing to the provisions in the Baez versus NYCHA settlement agreement 
which mandates that mold and moisture be treated at its source within 15 days of being notified by a tenant. Uh, yes, we are, and I just want to introduce uh, Kelly McNeil, our... So when that means that you're committed to it, that means that it's happening or it's going to happen. We, we are committed. We are committed to it. And what does the yeah, commitment Kelly, mean? Swearing. Okay, yes. Go ahead. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. So the question is more specifically around commitments. So wanting to understand what does commitment mean to you and what does commitment mean as far as a timeline? Because there are issues around mold that have been pervasive throughout my tenure as a council member and wanting to know where do we stand in terms of mold removal. I'm, I'm reading what's here in Next Gen and I'm not sure if what Next Gen is is an ideal or it's something that's implemented currently or is it something that you would like to strive for? So I want to be able to tell my residents, if you have a mold issue in your apartment, yes, it's going to be addressed um, and dealt with within 15 days and to be able to you know, take that commitment to the bank for my constituents. Or is it that I cannot give them that commitment that it's going to be addressed within 15 days? Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. so Presently, we are proceeding with revised procedures, enhanced training, and new instruments, as well as inspection and repair of all roof fans. When you speak to the uh, 15 days, there's, there are two, and, and I, can, I will need the operations staff to assist me, but there are two approaches to eradicating mold. There is simple and a more complex. And so we strive to meet the 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 um, the two uh, deadlines, um, and if there are outstanding um, capital work that is associated with a particular unit, then that is taken into consideration. But those uh, provisions of the simple, more complex repairs is an approach to eradicating mold. Right. So but let me, let me just, to get further clarity, I get with issues around mold that sometimes it can be a larger issue that's impacting the entire building. But is there something that happens immediately in an apartment that's possible to address almost in a band-aid attempt to address the issue of mold in that immediate household while at the same time addressing the larger issue and the two meeting in the middle? How do you approach that? So again, we are, we are extremely committed to addressing mold conditions, <clears throat> and, and yes, we need to improve on, on the level of service um, and in response to a condition of mold. Um, so there are some remedial actions that, w that can be taken. Some of those would be more, um, more short term, uh, as you said, um, putting kind of a, a, a quick fix on the problem um, while we address the underlying condition. But until you actually identify the source of the moisture, Right, and that can be complicated at times, especially in a large building or a large development. Um, so what we don't want is to go in there and to perform um, what the resident believes to be is a correction of the mold condition um, until we've actually addressed the underlying problem. It's to my understanding that a judge has found you in non-compliance of this particular court case. Can you understand why? Although we are disappointed in Judge Polly's recent rejecting rejection of the proposed consent decree. We will continue to work with plaintiffs and the special master to address the court's concerns. But um, we are going forward with the uh, uh, inspection and repair of the roof fans as well as enhanced training for uh, the maintenance staff that address mold as, as well as um, working with our re revised procedures and approaching eradicating mold. I just have two other questions. So as a new mom, I have a son that's eight months old, and to have issues such as lead and mold um, to be so pervasive throughout NYCHA and to be found in noncompliance um, for many families in particular, especially uh, families with young children, it's, it's frightening and it's disturbing that we are not in compliance 
and how we as leaders can go back to our communities knowing that the NYCHA, NYCHA is not in compliance with these particular regulations and that we have children that these sorts of issues can cause irreparable damage. And we have to make sure that we're not just committed to something, but that we are actually in compliance with something. And we need to make sure that there are repercussions for not being in compliance uh, moving forward. I just wanted to bring your issue to um, one final issue, uh, because I know that many of my colleagues would have questions that they want to ask. So the NYCHA Next Gen Plan, as it was originally laid out to me, um, how many developments are currently part of NYCHA Next Gen in terms of um, building and construction of utilizing vacant lots on NYCHA property uh, for housing and development? Because I know I have one in my district um, and Ingersoll houses, but how many um, are either, have either been identified or in the pipeline or have completed a project as it pertains to NYCHA Next Gen as far as construction? Yeah, my apologies, we don't have that information. Um, that's on the real estate side. We were focused on operations. Well, we but we could certainly get back to you with that. Mm -hmm. That's a difficult answer because there could have only been but so many of the NYCHA de developments at this time. I'm, I'm sure it's a, I'm sure while this is, you're talking more about capital improvements and that sort of thing and the developments, internally the entire organization should have an understanding of where NYCHA Next Gen stands. Um, what we're interested in at this particular time is how do we utilize vacant lots and property, not so much for private developers that come from outside of our community, but development that comes from internally within our community. For example, throughout Brooklyn's history, and I'm speaking about Brooklyn because I understand that history, but I'm sure it's part of other boroughs, our local churches have been instrumental in local development throughout our borough, particularly developing senior housing um, as far as it pertains to uh, our community. But in addition, with the downsizing that NYCHA um, has been looking to do, it's imperative that we create a pathway for our residents to have secure housing within their communities where they've grown up and lived all of their lives. So um, again, my apologies that we um, are not prepared to answer that question directly, um, but we certainly will follow up with you um, and schedule a meeting uh, to discuss that more in detail. I'd like a meeting, but I'd also like a hearing on it because if we have a hearing on it, then we can hold one another accountable. So I'll defer to um, our chair on that and we look forward to having you come back uh, with members of your team that are more prepared to discuss NYCHA Next Gen. Thank you. Thank you. That may be helpful to discuss during the upcoming um, budget hearing where we will talk about um, management, I mean, we will talk about um, development on all of the properties, in particular 50-50, 100%, as well as um, um, senior housing on development. So um, I think we have a date, so we'll share that with you in a moment. We've also been joined by Council Member Van Bramer, as well as Council Member um, Mark Traeger. And next up, we'll have questions from Council Member Reverend Ruben Diaz, Sr. from the Bronx. Thank you, Madam Chair, woman, and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. <clears throat> you know, Mr. Vito Mustachiulo and Kathy Penito. The biggest problem that I, the biggest complaint that I have as an elected official is about people reporting broken things in the apartment, reporting damages, and having no response from NYCHA. And they feel ignored, they feel neglected, they feel abandoned because they complain and complain and there is no response, like there is nobody, no one listening. And I could understand that. 
I could understand that because last time you people came here was on March 14, about a month ago. And I brought to your attention a problem. I told you that there was a woman that was working, a Cuban lady, working for 20 years in housing in Nacha. And I told you that she been providing all the paper and she's a legal resident. But now because in Washington they hold the paper and Nacha fire her. And I said, that's discrimination. That means she's been working, she has been working there 15 years. And then the chairman in that occasion that was sitting there told me, give me the papers. And I gave the paper to Miss Kerry June. She's the executive vice president and chief administrative, chief administrative officer. She has a big title, like the two of you here today. Big titles. So, if we come here to a public hearing, <coughs> and we are council members, and in front of us, to a council member, and in front of the audience, in record, you say, give me those papers, I'm gonna get back to you, I'm gonna get into this. As of, as, as of today, nothing happened, not even, not even a courtesy call to tell me what happened. If you ignore, ladies and gentlemen, if you ignore a city council member, I could imagine what you do to them. Because if you cannot respond to a city council member when you come, when you promise yourself to do it in a public hearing. And, and, as, and you say, give me the paper, and the paper I handed to you in front of everyone, and you don't care about it. You don't even do anything about it. Then I said, no wonder. No wonder that that's people in housing live the way they live. Nobody cares. Nobody responds. Nobody, nobody, you know, it's like, lady for you. I'm going to get my son up. I'm going to get my big title, vice president, chief administrative officer, and I'm going to get my big title, and that's it. So I'm saying to you today, there's a new, the, chair, the chairwoman resigned, there's a new person, maybe, maybe we could start something, like let's, let's do something. Let's, let's, it's enough. It's too much already. So, um, Thank you. Sir, with all due respect, um, I, don't, I don't think it's appropriate in, in this particular forum, this type of public hearing, to discuss a confidential matter regarding an employee or their wait, status. Wait, wait. Sir, please, let me wait, finish. Wait, 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 sir, wait, wait. No, 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 no. You don't want to get away with that one. No, no, sir. L no, allow me to no, finish. No, wait, allow hold, hold. You're telling me sir, it's no problem for me to tell you. Me? It, this, it's no problem for me to tell you in a public hearing that you in a public hearing Commit yourself to answer back to a city council member that asks you a question, and you are you ignore that, and you tell me that's not proper for me to bring it in, sir. If you allow me to finish my answer, right? It's not a matter that I would like to discuss publicly. As soon as this hearing concludes, myself and Kerry will sit down with you, and we will discuss the specifics of the issue that you raised at the last hearing. Nah, it's not the Bronx. In that sir, in the I, sir. I think every member can tell you that, that sir, I, I am sir, reachable. I'm sorry. This is not a way to treat this uh, resident of NYCHA. That's what they're happening. Because sir, you're, okay, the issue that you're you. talking about Let's has to do privately. with an employee, not with a NYCHA resident. There's a big difference, sir. Well, if you don't respond to me, you don't respond to them. Okay. Okay, we were also joined by Councilwoman Diana Ayala, but I just want to say that um, Councilmember Ruben Diaz Sr. Um, you know, deserves a response because it was something that was stated during the previous hearing, and I, I understand that there may be some dynamics to it, but um, we would really appreciate a response to um, his And we will be glad questions. to meet with the Councilmember as soon as the hearing is over. Okay. 
Um, next, Council Member Richards. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for doing this hearing. Uh, I guess I don't have many questions, but um, I wanted to know, and if you can just walk us through how, uh, how does property managers, who do they report to, how often do they meet with central staff in NYCHA? And I say that because one of the things we often hear um, from residents, and I know Vito in particular walked uh, a few Rockaway developments with me, um, I'm just astonished most of the time at how little they know of what's going on in the actual development. Um, as managers, I would assume that they would be required to walk the grounds or at least walk the entrances to know, um, you know, if locks are broken on doors. And I, I'm always astonished when I go to a development and they know they don't, they, there's very little knowledge of what's going on on the ground. So I wanted to just hear a little bit of how you look at metrics on effectiveness in doing their job. Um, I mean, it's one thing if you said they can't make it to every individual apartment to see every issue, but it's another thing when there's garbage thrown outside on the grass. I mean, so uh, what I'm trying to get to is what many residents want to know is if some of these property managers actually care. Um, because it would be hard for me, at, le at least as a council member, when I drive by or walk by a development, and I see garbage and things, we'll report it, but I, I'm assuming they are there every day and would have to walk by these conditions and sh should respond appropriately. So um, just wanted to hear a little bit more about the metrics and who do they report to and how often is that happening? Uh, thank you very much, sir. And, and again, thank you for your continued support. Um, so I, I just want to start and then I will hand off to Kathy to, to elaborate more. Um, but the one thing that I have been looking at um, are the duties and responsibilities of the property manager. Right? And, and I believe that, that currently property managers um, have some responsibilities that we should take away from them and that their focus should be on the maintenance and the upkeep of the buildings um, and, and responding to, to the uh, residents' uh, conditions and complaints. Um, so there are some administrative functions that we're looking to to centralize and to take away from the property manager, freeing up their time. Um, so Can you go through some of those things? Sure. I, you know, for, so one in particular has to do with um, rent collection um, okay. and following okay. up on rent arrears. It's an extremely time-consuming process. Um, it's something that I, I believe that we, uh, and we're taking a close look at how we can centralize that process. Um, you know, for instance, if we need to go to court, um, the property manager and or their staff go to court. Um, that takes up a, a lot of their time and resources, mm -hmm. time that should be spent at the development. Uh, and I agree with you that we need to spend more time um, walking the development, understanding what the conditions are, talking to residents. Um, so, uh, you know, there are some functions that, again, I think when we start to take that off of their plate, um, it will allow for an opportunity for them to really um, serve the, the development in a much better way. Um, so, Kathy, we'll talk about some of the metrics. and. So just one comment is that you're absolutely right um, that it is the staff who work at the, our developments who are the eyes. Everything is not, cannot be stored in a database system. We can run all our fancy reports at headquarters, but it, we rely heavily on eyes on the property. That is a core responsibility of our superintendents and our property managers. And I will ask Carolyn Jasper, our VP of Operations, to kind of describe those responsibilities in more detail. Well, responding to your question regarding who the property manager reports to, each property manager reports to a regional asset manager. Um, I know the area that you're talking about in particular, I know out in Far Rockaway for some time, we've had a vacancy there for a regional asset manager. So actually we have uh, presently, just most recently, a new asset manager was recently appointed. So for the past several months, we've only had one regional asset manager and the deputy director overseeing um, actually all of Far Rockaway and all of Queens. Um, the regional asset manager who was formerly there was responsible for overseeing 10 developments. So what we've also done is that we've realigned that area to make it a smaller size and more manageable. So the new regional asset manager will only see about five or six properties and, you know, uh, be responsible for five or six properties. And then there will be another regional asset manager assigned to the developments in Staten Island to oversee those properties. 
the responsibility of both the manager and the superintendent, as well as other development supervisors, they're responsible for monitoring the conditions of the property. Um, as far as uh, janitorial conditions, actually um, daily, there is a caretaker of supervisors uh, daily checklist where the supervisor of caretaker is responsible for ensuring that you know they are completing that checklist daily and any type of um, say repair, say open door, um, any lights that may be out in public spaces, um, any unsightly janitorial conditions or hazardous conditions, those issues should be addressed daily. Um, you're absolutely right. Um, as a part of NGO, the property and management super, they are the individuals who are frontline at the property. So they should not have to wait for a regional asset manager to come out to the property and have them or instruct them on issues that are not satisfactory. Um, I know that there have been some challenges in a few of the locations. Um, at this time, I don't want to discuss because there are certain actions that we are taking that you know I do not want to discuss here publicly. But again, that goes back to again with us holding individuals accountable. You know, not only at the property management, at not only at the the property manager level, but again, the property manager, the property maintenance supervisor, supervisors on down have to be held accountable. So when we talk about janitorial conditions, you also have a supervisor of caretaker who is responsible for being out there every day and ensuring that caretakers are properly cleaning. If those caretakers are not properly cleaning, then again, do they need additional training? Or again, is it just the lack of them taking an interest in doing their uh, tasks properly. So um, with that said, um, again, the accountability is at the development level and the regional asset manager is responsible for monitoring um, performance metrics. Actually, they should be looking at those performance metrics daily to um, not only monitor the janitorial, but also monitor um, operational issues regarding um, the turnover time, apartment uh, prep and maintenance. Um, addressing work orders. So there are a variety of uh, responsibilities that the regional asset manager is responsible for as well. However, being that they oversee anywhere, I would say from perhaps maybe five to, five to either seven or eight properties, they cannot be at a property every single day. So for the most part, that regional asset manager is perhaps focusing on developments that have more complex challenges. Okay, and who do they report to? The regional asset managers report to the director. And the director is and the at director, central or? The director works out of the borough office, right? So, you know, you have a Queens borough office, Queens and Staten Island borough office, a Brooklyn uh, borough office, a uh, Bronx borough office, so they're okay. different offices that they work out of and they have support staff that work out of those offices but the prop but the directors also go out and they also inspect properties at times they receive complaints at their level and they also go out and they inspect conditions as well okay, okay so I, I don't want to take up too much more time but um I, I just just I just have a critique on all of this because it's not happening um, and, and I would really suggest that Central take more ownership in this area than leaving it at the local level um, because I've just, seen, I've just seen too much over the, over the past of the course of the last decade to believe that we're actually, this particular system is actually working. So I'm hoping that you're gonna really um, readjust your strategy and, and, and look at it differently because they need to, we need to take it out of the local hands, it's not working. Um, um, and then I I'll just lastly add, um, uh, just on a comment you made, uh, General Manager Mascacello, um on the centralizing the rent, so I, I would just implore you to ensure that residents, now will residents have to now come to 250 Broadway to address this issue? of rent or arrears eventually? Well, what, so, what we it, would love is that they just do everything online. Well, so everybody we have, doesn't. We have something like right. eight ways they can pay right. the rent. So, right. you know, the, the, the Right, but if you're in the, the case of arrears yeah. or something complex, we yeah. don't want our residents to now have difficulty in figuring a way to not. get to an office or something of that nature. No, no, absolutely. No. All right, not, so I just uh, wanted to put that right. out there as well. So. That's my comment. Thank I you. hope we'll continue to look at this, but there's a lot of work to be done around this. Thank you. 
Council Member Salamanca, followed by Council Member Jonai. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning. Uh, I just want to start off this hearing just to express, um, I, I've known Vito for some time now when he was the uh, Deputy uh, Commissioner for HPD for the, the Division of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services. And um, Vito, I have full confidence in you uh, as the new general manager, NYCHA, that you will do the best of your ability to try to address a lot of these issues that are occurring, the, uh, the mismanagement that has happened for years at NYCHA. Um, but in order for you to be effective, the, the property managers need to get the job done and get the job done the right way. That's the only way this is going to work uh, for you. So my, uh, my first question is, how often are property managers evaluated? How does the evaluation process work? <clears throat> so, um, sir, first of all, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask either Kathy or, or Carolyn to ask, uh, answer that um, question. But again, I just want to reiterate um, that this is a team effort right? and, and that we need to do better at supporting the property managers, both from above as well as from below. Right? It's not about one individual. Right? And yes, they're charged with the responsibility um, of the day-to-day -day operations at the development level. Um, but I, I charge all of us with, with making sure that they have the proper tools, um, the proper training right, to actually accomplish that. Um, so I, I, I would never say that it's, it's one person's um, responsibility. It's all of ours. No, I, I, I accept that responsibility. Um, I, and I understand that. So, you know, I have about 20 developments in my district alone. And I have NYCHA developments that you can just tell by walking in there that they've been mismanaged for years. And the same property manager has been there for years. So my question is, how often do property managers get evaluated? Is there an evaluation for them? Property managers. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah. Sorry. Property managers are evaluated initially when they are hired. They okay. are on probation. So there's no job evaluation, you know, like an annual evaluation to see how they're doing in that past year? Okay, so there is an evaluation for one year, and that is a contractual agreement, okay? Uh, thereafter, there's no other formal um, evaluation. However, um, property managers and superintendents, they have to be held accountable for performing their work. So although they are no longer under a formal evaluation, their work is still to be evaluated. Again, based on metrics, based on, you know, conditions of the property. Um, I, know. I don't know how you're managing a property manager if you're not doing an annual evaluation. That makes absolutely no sense to okay. me. Okay, so. There needs to be a written evaluation so that you can have something in writing and keep a paper trail if they're actually doing what they need to do. And you're telling me that you don't have a paper trail. You don't have an annual evaluation on your manager. You just do it one time, well, and that's it. Well, let me, I'm, I'm going to finish. So although there is no formal evaluation after that initial evaluation, there is still a disciplinary process in place. So if the supervisors, and this is at every level, find that an employee, whether it is a property manager or a property maintenance supervisor, if they are not performing up to standards or up to par, their supervisor is responsible for progressive, taking progressive disciplinary action. And that can be the form of initially starting with an instructional memorandum, leading up to a counseling memorandum, a local hearing, and thereafter a general trial hearing. So that is the formal process. How, but how do you discipline someone when I, without uh, evaluating them on paper? I just, it just doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make any sense. So, I'm sorry, council member. Um, so w with respect to uh, the property managers, and as we stated earlier um, in the hearing, um, property managers are, are members of um, the Teamsters Local 237. Um, so they are uh, in the evaluations that we're talking about um, that is subject of, of mandatory collective bargaining. Um, so we need, that's an area that we need to improve on. Okay. Right, we, we need to be able to have the tools that, that, um, that we need to better evaluate all, all of our staff. Um, and, and again, I just to go back to the, your point, um, and, and this is something that I hope to bring some of the experience that I had from HPD uh, to NYCHA. Um, we're data rich. Um, how we use that information, how we make informed decisions, um, the staffing levels um, that are assigned to each of the developments. Right, these are all important factors. Um, 
and it, it does reflect on the performance of the property manager. Um, so I, I hear exactly what you're saying. I agree with you. I agree that we need to have better metrics, better performance indicators, um, and we need to do a better job of understanding what that all means and to get the resources um, to the developments where they're needed. How do you evaluate the performance of your ground caretakers? Do they have an, a an annual evaluation as well? Managers. I'm sorry? Your ground takers, your ground caretakers, the caretakers. How do you evaluate their performance? Do you have an annual evaluation for them? No, that is actually the same. It's uh, subject to collective bargaining. Um, with respect, again, with respect to a formal process, right, um, we, we need to, to set performance standards and metrics for all of our staff. So just to follow up on that, if you um, are unable to um, like do an evaluation on the individuals because of union and collective bargaining, this, this and the other, um, how are you then measuring success within the developments? If we're not talking about um, measuring or doing evaluations on the individuals, how do you measure success on a development level? So in the NGO model, we have a number of what we call performance metrics that we measure the properties on. And we can do these measures and, and collect information on performance based on an entire borough, based on an individual development. As far as our work order system, we can drill down on, into our skilled trades and into all of our maintenance work orders to look at productivity measures by individual employees. So we do have a lot of information that we can use to um, improve performance or address performance deficiencies. So, so there's a variety of indicators we measure, we call service levels. We're able to measure the length of time it takes to complete work in every trade and for every maintenance work order and we can do that by each unique property. And that's some of the information that we use, as Ms. Jasper was describing, while we're prohibited at this time from doing professional annual evaluations, we are able to provide you know, feedback and accountability to our staff through the data tracking systems that we have. So that does move forward. We also um, measure our performance on how quickly we prepare vacant units, um, how our rent collections are conducted. So these are the measures that we can compare and contrast between our portfolios. All right, thank you. Um, when is your collective, uh, collective bargaining, your union contract offer renewal? Uh, this May. Okay, so I really hope that you advocate for annual evaluations of your employees in this contract. I have no idea how you're holding your employees accountable if you're not uh, evaluating them on an annual basis. Um, tell me about uh, the, uh, so here in your presentation on page nine, you mentioned that um, your uh, employees responded to 2.7 million maintenance and repair requests. Uh, one of the main complaints and concerns I have in my community, in my developments, is that they put in a service request and it is closed within some time and it never gets addressed. So please, can you tell me the process on how service requests are supposed to properly be addressed? Sure, uh, thank you for the question. Um, the majority, over 60% of the work orders that we receive are work orders that the um, residents call into us or submit to us online through our, through our My NYCHA app. So the majority of the requests come from tenants um, and the, uh, the balance of work orders that are opened are via uh, primarily inspections that we do with the properties. Um, we acknowledge that there is a problem in our scheduling process and our notification. So one of the things I've recently learned, again, I'm kind of fresh eyes on how we do what we do in operations, and we have um, noted a very high what we call rate of tenant not at home. So what that means is we have an open work order, a request for service, and the, the, the request is closed with the code that says tenant not at home. We think that rate is too high and it contributes to a lot of work orders being closed um, and work not 
getting done. Now the tenant, uh, the resident is notified when we make the attempt to come to the apartment that we came twice, you weren't home, please call us to reschedule. But we think that, that we acknowledge that there are flaws in that process. Major flaws. And I, I think that the tenant at a home is just an excuse for I didn't go to that apartment. Um, and so my question is, my question is, how are you auditing each development or monitoring each development uh, to see how these service requests or service complaints are being addressed? Or do you have a system to monitor them? We do have the ability to monitor how many work orders are closed with work completed. Those are the ones we do the quality assurance on. And we also do have record keeping on those that are closed with no work completed. Right now, we are testing, I call it an ad hoc, at about 15 developments, maybe a little more. We have pulled our information to identify all instances where we have what we call high rates of tenant not at home. We have met with those individual employees. Their supervisors have met with them to set goals and to increase supervision on the closure of those work orders. In other words, we think that by increasing our supervision on the tenant not at home cases, that we can get that reduced, get into more units, and make more repairs. Do you do that in writing to these individual caretakers, or is this something just verbal? At this stage, it is verbal because we're testing out what is going to work. So, so increased supervision, will that help us attend to better performance? We're also looking at how can we empower our maintenance workers to do call ahead. So if they get on one work order in the morning, they're supposed to be at their next appointment, let's say by 1 o'clock, but the particular job they're on takes longer. What happens is there's no communication to the resident saying, I'm late, or, and so the resident, and this is not okay, is sitting waiting all day. So we're trying to implement ways that they can quickly pull up the phone number, do a call ahead to say, I'm on the way or I'm two hours late. All right. Right. And uh, Council Member, I'm sorry to add to this um, conversation too. Um, the resident not at home, um, to me, it's a perfectly legitimate um, problem that we're dealing with. Um, when I first came to NYCHA, I was surprised that our staff, our maintenance staff, um, the skilled trades, uh, don't work beyond 4.30. Right? Um, and so the, rely the dependence then is on the emergency services division that work the after hours um, to perform after hour uh, repairs. Right? And when we service 175,000 apartments and a vast majority of our residents work, go to school, um, they're not home Monday through Friday from 8 to 4. And so where we need to improve and to work collaboratively with, with the unions um, is to expand the hours that we work, uh, where repairs are made. Right. Vito, the internal system is flawed. That is why you're having the mismanagement that's happening in NYCHA, and I really hope you can help address that. Um, it, you're, on page nine, you also mentioned that uh, NYCHA conducts 48,000 routine apartment inspections. My question is, how often do you inspect every apartment? So we are um, inspecting, uh, we're, our goal is to inspect each property every other year. We would like to inspect every property every year, but frankly, the people who do the repairs are the same people who do the inspection. So we have to balance the inspections against getting the work done. So we are going to be scheduled, or we've already scheduled for this year 82,000 units. We'll go through a routine inspection, which is our opportunity to get in a unit, assess the condition of the unit, actually make repairs at the time we're in the unit, and then create additional work orders um, that will be scheduled at a later point. In 2017, we completed 48,231 apartment inspections and which generated 89,740 work orders, of which we have already completed 69,000. So we do uh, believe that inspections will give us a better assessment of unit conditions, and we are um, planning to move uh, forward with getting into as many units as we can this year. So I've been in office for two years. 
I've been walking through my NYCHA developments. They're units that look, that obviously have not been inspected in decades. And, you know, it's again, once again, a flawed system that the same individuals who are doing repairs, who have a high tenancy or a high rate of tenant not home, closing tickets of tenant not homes, are the same individuals that you're depending on to do inspections. Flawed system again. Um, my last question uh, would have to be in terms of your rat infestation. I have certain NYCHA developments that have a higher con concentration of rat infestations. Um, is, this, is this a skilled trade? How are you addressing this? How can we work together uh, to address this in some of my NYCHA developments? So, so we do have um, ex exterminators um, on staff. They're part of the skilled trades. Um, and um, as you may know, we announced um, that NYCHA is a big part of the mayor's rat reduction program. And in fact, the mayor um, allocated $25 million of capital money um, to us to invest in, in, I believe it's nine or 10 developments um, throughout the boroughs. Um, if you have a, a specific development where you believe um, that the rat infestation is problematic, please let's talk after and, and we'll see what we can do to I have I have uh, one that comes to mind and I see the president from Adam Houses, he calls me once a week, um, issues, you know, rat infestation. Um, and yeah, of course you have Jackson Houses, Mr. Danny Barber had the same thing at Melrose, but I'm constantly getting calls once a week from Adam Houses in terms of it, the raccoons that are coming out of these holes in the grounds. Raccoons as well. But yeah, you know what I mean. I'm yeah. just exaggerating in terms of the rats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Thank Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Jonai, followed by Councilmember Traeger. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm uh, very pleased that we're going to be holding separate hearings on Next Generation RAD, uh, because these are very complicated issues, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing more about uh, those programs. Um, first of all, I think you've received praises from everyone here, Vito. We all have a working relationship with you, and uh, we're really pleased that you are now at this capacity and hopefully you'll be able to address some of the issues that have been impacting uh, NYCHA residents for decades. At one point, NYCHA properties, complexes, had full live-in superintendents. They no longer have full-time live-in superintendents. Please explain to me why they were removed from the beginning and why we haven't replaced those positions with full-time live-in superintendents, similar to what private landlords are required to have. Sure. So I, I, it's a great question um, and something that, that Kerry, um, who's going to help um, respond to your question. <clears throat> something that we've been talking about. Um, I, I don't know of a, of a time when NYCHA required a live-in superintendent or had one in every um, development or building. Uh, I do know that there are restrictions with respect to, and again, this goes back to collective bargaining um, agreements this, uh, specific with um, to certain titles. Um, so what we're starting to do is to explore um, if there are any other titles that we use or that we have employees in, that we can expand that program. Right. Um, you know, the law requires that an owner either um, live in the building, um, have a superintendent, um, or provide for services. Um, so we do fulfill the obligation under the law uh, because we do provide for 24-hour um, access and services. Um, but I, I agree with you, and I think that having someone who lives on, on the development, um, who can respond to um, emergency conditions after hours, um, who has a real ownership interest in, in the property, um, I think that that's a, a way that we should be um, moving towards. Um, but again, there are some challenges with respect to uh, collective bargaining issues. Um, Kerry, I don't know if you want to add any more to that. Uh, sure. So we do have um, a title that's a chief caretaker, which is uh, somebody who is able to live in a property as well as perform some maintenance work. Um, it's akin to a, a live-in superintendent, but it's not a superintendent as we use the t civil service title. Uh, there's a civil service restriction on the title where it's used in scattered sites and senior 
development, senior housing. Uh, we will be looking to, um, we are looking into the possibility of expanding that um, and, and trying to design a title where we can have more live-in uh, live uh, employees. I don't think we're, we much care much for titles, and that's not the objective. I don't care what he's called or she's called. The idea of having someone that's living on site that is experiencing the same issues as all other residents is the real concern here. When that live-in resident doesn't have heat, this caretaker or superintendent doesn't have heat, uh, knows enough to go restart a boiler, hands-on, more visual, um, responsibilities and reporting and addressing. This is what the concern is, not so much in titles, not so much in provisions of law. There is no reason why we couldn't move immediately to have live-in resident employees with these responsibilities, uh, which would be the same responsibilities that we put on private landlords. Right. So, and we, in fact, have two live-in supers um, in two of the developments in your district. Um, so, but again, it's a, it's a great idea, and it's something that we're looking to expand on. We need to expand, and I, I, I hope that we do quickly. What, and I'm hearing the back and forth, and I'm just trying to evaluate the responsibilities of these property managers. Doesn't sound much different than the responsibilities of property managers for private landlords. And I'm just trying to understand why we're coming up with so many excuses for them. When private landlords have property managers that do rent collections, go to court, meet with tenants, evaluate employees, address issues, hire contractors, same responsibilities. Why are we coming up with excuses for our, res our property managers when they're clearly Property managers are doing this work for the entire city. Right, and sir, I'm, I'm not making excuses for anyone. What I'm saying is that I think that the challenges that we're faced with go beyond one particular group of individuals. Um, it's not just the property manager. Uh, but you, it's hard for, uh, for us to compare ourselves to any other um, private owner in the city. Um, if you look at NYCHA, if you look at the vast, um, the vastness of NYCHA, if we were a city, we would be the second largest city in the state of New York. Right? There's no other property owner in New York City that comes close to managing or maintaining 175,000 units. Um, these are some real challenges. We have other challenges that we have to live within constraints of civil servant titles and, and union issues. Some of those issues are not the same that private owners necessarily share. Um, and then there's also the pay scale. And a, a private manager in a building with 4,000 units, I'm sure, makes a little bit more than what our property managers make. Um, so there aren't direct correlations between the two. And again, I'm not making excuses. Um, I think what I'm accepting is the responsibility that, that when we talk about property managers, we should be talking about property management, right? not about the individual, not about the 270 or so um, people that m are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. It's about how we manage the properties. Right. And I think that that's the issue that, that we need to address. You know, I, I agree that NYCHA is a huge undertaking, but this city has more than 175,000 units that are under private management. Not under a single private management. Well, they, but we have that. I, I think we're trying to split hairs here. New York City has many more units housing units that are in a private sector. <laughs> Is this a fact? Yes. And they're managing their properties. And they're m providing services for the most part in your previous capacity. And I wonder, under your previous capacity, hearing uh, from what I'm sitting on this side of the table, where you were many a times with private landlords, would you have accepted the, re the responses that you are currently giving me or us today. We're trying, we understand, we're seeking, we're acknowledging. You would have sat there and listened and then you would have did one of two things. You would have took out a pair of scissors or a hammer and you would have hit that property owner one way or another. 
We're government. Right. We're supposed to be able to do things better than the private industry. We're supposed to hold ourselves at a higher standard, not at a lesser standard. When it comes to the reporting that was done in March of 2017, where it was stated that 83% of apartment units that were inspected by the Department of Health showed severe hazardous conditions in these apartments. What would have been the approach for a private landlord? Wouldn't there be a violation issued? Wouldn't there be emergency repairs that would be coming into those units? Why are we not holding NYCHA to the same standard and providing the same protections to our NYCHA residents that we would to all other New York City residents? So, sir, I think what I'm saying is that I hold myself responsible, and, and everyone who's sitting here with us today, um, so it's the entire NYCHA team, right? Um, the, NYCHA is not a private owner, right? And, and we have been suffering from decades of disinvestment and, and deferred maintenance. Most private owners are not reliant on the federal government or the state, or even the city for that matter, to provide them with money to make necessary repairs. Private owners, as you well know, when they make major investments in new roofs or boilers, pass along major capital improvement increases to recoup their investments from the residents. We don't do that. Right? Private owners do not cap the rent that they can charge to their residents at th no more than 30% of their annual income. Right? We're faced with a number of challenges that private owners are not faced with. With respect to my previous role, I, in my 30 plus years in enforcement, never held one person responsible, especially a property manager. I hold the owners responsible. Oh. Right? And I am now the owner, right? By virtue of the fact that I'm the general manager and the chief operating officer for NYCHA. I hold myself responsible. I, I don't hold an individual responsible at a development level. And, and let, if, if I'm giving them the resources that they need, if we're providing for the major capital improvements that we need to provide. We're providing for the resources to do the day-to-day -day maintenance and respond to two and a half million complaints a year. And then I would hold that person responsible. Right? But we have not provided them with those resources as of yet. Right? With respect to the State Department of Health report, I'm still waiting for the state to provide me with the specifics of their report. I read the report. It's a great reading report. Right? You know, after the governor announced the fact that the state was conducting this investigation, Within that first, that same week, I was up in Albany and I met with the State Department of Health. I actually called them up and asked them to have a face-to-face -face with me. And, and I, I asked them the one thing that I wanted from, from this exercise, this investigation, is that if they came across serious conditions, right, life and safety issues, that they reach out to me directly. Right? I give them my cell phone number, I give them my, e my email address, right? because we should be responding to those timely. We shouldn't wait for a report to come out. And I received maybe three emails with six or seven addresses of conditions. Right. So the 280 or so conditions that they cite in the report, I haven't seen the details of it yet. Right. I've reached out to the state, and I patiently wait for their response. The mold and lead is a serious issue. Yes, it is. Okay. What is the current requirement on private landlords with mold and lead issues. You're talking about if a violation is issued mm -hmm. for lead paint hazards, they have 21 days to correct. And if they don't correct in 21 days, what happens then? Well, uh, either HPD can bring enforcement actions in housing court mm -hmm. um, or emergency repairs. Right. Why aren't we doing the same for NYCHA housing? Um, sir, I don't believe that we're not, we're, we're holding ourselves to the same standards. Well, we clearly have uh, lead violations that have been going on forever that haven't been removed, and we have current mold conditions that are ongoing and repetitive due to the failure of addressing the underlying issue and the repetitiveness of mold. Well, this is not. If we can separate the two issues, um, for lead based paint hazards, 
um, when the State Department of Health, I'm sorry, the City Department of Health issues um, a commissioner's order to abate, we respond to those in, in the time prescribed by law. And we work closely with uh, our colleagues at the City Department of Health. Um, and in fact, we, to the best of my knowledge, in each of the cases that they've referred to us, we've responded and corrected in a timely fashion. Right, if you're talking, I think you're talking about um, the visual assessments, and, and we just recently completed um, over 9,000 visual assessments as required by Local Law 1. Right, and in response to those visual assessments, um, we've performed over 7,000 remediations. Right, so, and I'm not suggesting that there isn't room for us to do better right, and that we still need to focus on full compliance. We're doing great work, right? And I think that a lot of that is getting lost, right? Um, the public doesn't hear about all of the, the good work. The public doesn't see the pictures of the apartments um, that I've visited in, in our developments where residents have beautiful homes, right? And, and they're well maintained. And, and that's in part because of the relationship between the resident and the property management staff, right? And so it's unfortunate that we only focus on, on on the unsightly conditions, on the bad conditions, yeah. right? But out of the 175,000 units, they don't all look that way. Vito, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but we're not here to praise. We're here to address issues that have gone too far without being and, addressed. So I'm not praising. I'm just right. trying to be right. constructive. And right, and there'll be time for patting people on the back. As you know, I come from this world, yeah. and if I would have responded to any agency or department with how come you're not focused on all the good work I'm doing but you're focused on this one problem, you would have responded or the agency or the appropriate department would have responded with, this is a problem. Legally you're required to correct this condition to make sure it doesn't reoccur and it doesn't exist. That would have been the response. Not of all the great work that I've accomplished. Right, so sir, let me take that back then. I yeah. acknowledge the fact that we need to do better and and we will do better. Well, I well, I would I strive that we all should always look to do better. But why are we issuing actual violations, HPD violations, on these units so they are become a matter of record? And work orders seem to appear and disappear and reappear and re-disappear. So, so first, with with respect to HPD violations, um, the issuance of a violation without the enforcement actions that follow. Are meaningless. But we have enforcement. No, sir, uh, the emergency city, repairs. But HPD cannot perform emergency repairs in NYCHA owned buildings. Um, and it, honestly, it makes no sense to, to take away the valuable resources that HPD has in protecting the residents in private housing in New York City uh, to focus on, on NYCHA buildings. That's our response. Because NYCHA needs the attention. No, sir, we can do this internally, right? And we will do this internally. Um, and, and we need to do better. And, and there has been a lot, I, I've said this repeatedly, for good, bad, or indifferent, the attention that's being paid to NYCHA um, has resulted in, in new funding streams, new resources coming to us. Right? And, and we need, need to do better in, in how we spend that money. We need to be more proactive um, in, in how we address the conditions. We need to start to, in, to protect our capital investments. And when we replace a roof on a building, my feeling is that then we should go into the apartments and correct the conditions in the apartments that resulted from the years of, of neglect um, and water leaks. Yeah, I have one more question for you. Since we brought up rent collections, I believe it's $1 billion a year which is collected in rents from our residents? It's, it's uh, over $1 billion and uh, yeah to the earlier question about what percent of our budget, it's 32% of our budget is relying on tenant uh, rent. So I, I have a question on rent collections. What percentage of the collectible rent are, is NYCHA collecting? Our current collection rate is 92%. Very good. And who collects that money? NYCHA. So I would hope with a collection rate of 92%, which is pretty good in New York City, that you would start, we would start focusing on maintaining our properties so we can get that same 92% of rent, similar to rent collections. We're focused more on rent collections than addressing the issues. Thank you. 
thank you. And I just want to um, just pinpoint that um, in your response to um, today's hearing, it would be helpful to just have some lessons learned or best practices from the sites or the developments that have a site caretaker or um, chief caretaker um, to see how things are working out in those developments. And I know that um, Ms. Ford was here and Claremont Consolidate is one of those developments. And it would be also helpful to know how many of the property managers um, are actual NYCHA residents as well. Traeger followed by Councilwoman Ayala. Thank you very much, Chair, for this very important and timely hearing. And uh, good to see you again, Vito. And I want to again uh, thank you for coming down to Coney Island recently to meet with our resident leaders. Every uh, three months, I uh, put together uh, a meeting of my NYCHA residents, my NYCHA leaders, to discuss ongoing sanity recovery efforts. And I do want to acknowledge that you came, and along with a lot of NYCHA staff as well. Uh, you know, I, I read through the packet that NYCHA prepared for this hearing with regards to the uh, services that property management is expected to deliver. Um, and I think we heard from some of my colleagues, but I think it's worth emphasizing that the one service area that seems to not be a problem for NYCHA uh, in terms of capacity and in terms of delivering is rent collection. Uh, if you ask folks to clean a hallway, you'll wait a while. But those envelopes waiting to pick up the checks are there. Um, I have a question about the amount of buildings, units, residents, versus the amount of caretakers, maintenance workers, managers. Is there any official ratio that NYCHA uses to determine how many maintenance workers, how many caretakers should be assigned to particular uh, buildings and properties? Can you share that with us? So um, we have one caretaker for every 57 units, and we have one maintenance worker for every 224 units. So that's an example of some of our ratios. So let me just get this straight. It says here that you have about 3,000 caretakers. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Now, is that caretaker positions, or is that uh, are, are there 3,000 existing caretakers, or are there 3,000 caretaker positions? That's existing head. Count. Existing. Do you have any vacancies in caretakers? We usually do. Yes. You, you say I mean, there's turnover. How many? Well, you see, now we're, now we're getting somewhere. But how many vacancies do you have in caretakers? It's, it's not a big number. Do we? Right, we'll we have to have get it. back to you. We don't have that exact number with us, but we will get back to you. But it, it's not a significant number. Do you have data on the caretaker maintenance worker retention rates? We can get it for you. We don't have it with us today. Respectfully, this is a hearing about property management, and we need to know about who's doing the work. And if we don't know who's going, who's staying, that's a problem. Um, we need that data. We do know that the retention uh, rate for a property manager is approximately seven years, but we can gather that other right. information. So I don't, I, I don't think, I think this ratio is out of whack because I'm seeing here that you have over 2,400 buildings, but you have about, which means under 3,000 caretakers, which to me right away that just is not working. And you're saying that there's existing vacancies in the amount of caretakers. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. And it says you have nearly 800 maintenance workers for 2,400 buildings. Do you feel that that is a sufficient ratio? Well, uh, if you're to ask one of our directors or a property manager, they will always say that they can use more staff. Uh, based on our current service levels for maintenance workers, which is about four days, from when we re receive a request for service to when we complete the service, that would indicate we have enough maintenance workers. I think where we don't have enough staff is in our skilled trades, and those are the types of services 
that we hear the highest number of complaints, rightly so, from tenants, because the skilled trades have backlogs and it takes much longer to schedule that work. So there are staffing challenges uh, in other areas of the organization. Out of 400,000 NYCHA residents, how many folks are members of skilled trades or on the process or in the roadmap or on the, on the path to get credentials to be members of, of the skilled trades? Do you have that data? We can tell you how many of our um, skilled trade employees um, are NYCHA residents. Well, but do you have data on how many NYCHA residents are members of the trades? Because if you need to hire folks, there are over 400,000 people, I think, that are more than happy to uh, be helpful in their own developments. Sure. Um, sir, um, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to Executive Vice President Sadea Sherman. Hi. Uh, Sadia Sherman, EVP for Community Engagement and Partnerships. One second. Oh, right, right. Oh, Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're getting the number of NYCHA resident employees who are also part of the skilled trades. Um, but in terms of residents who are in the pipeline who are apprentices, over the past three years we've been able to connect around 190 residents to apprentices. That's across a variety of trades. Um, some of those are residents who are, who are recently employed with NYCHA. They may be residents who are employed with private contractors as well. So about 190 people or so who are in the pipeline? Who, who we know have entered the pipeline as apprentices over these past three years. That does not account for residents who are already union members. Um, NYCHA would know, have knowledge of those who are NYCHA employees, but we don't have necessarily um, data from every respective trade of who their, their members are. So the is. unions have never disclosed that to you or shared that information, how many of, of their members are NYCHA residents? So we've not received um, reporting from the building trains of, of who amongst their, res their membership are NYCHA residents. We have knowledge of those that we've connected or those that we've directly employed. Right, sir, and that is something that we have actively sought out. Right, because this is, this is a hiring pipeline right there and then. And if you're telling me that there's existing vacancies, you have a lot of talent in, 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 in our buildings here. Um, I, I'm also uh, curious, NYCHA ever, overall, in terms of its maintenance budget, how many existing vacancies are in its overall maintenance budget? Okay, so, so while um, Kerry Jew is looking that up, um, I do want to go back to a point that I, I made earlier, um, and you've talked about caretakers. Um, it's important to, to remember, right, realize that aside from the developments that are in Flex Ops, our caretakers work Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30, right? And we need to do better, right? Um, and, and I've had some, some really productive conversations with the unions, um, and I hope that we can be in a better place um, after the upcoming uh, collective bargaining uh, negotiations. Um, but at, at Flex Ops, our caretakers work from, from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Right? And that makes a huge difference. Right? And, and so when a resident leaves their home in the morning, in the, in the developments where Flex Ops is in place, there's someone who's there cleaning the floors. When they come home at night, there's someone who's there. Right, right. but and it's unfortunate, but that's not throughout the entire. But, but respectfully, we just heard uh, that <coughs> NYCHA has heard requests from property managers and from folks on the ground that they need more staff. So who are they asking for more? You're saying, we heard about the, the, the construction trades, which is an issue that you're still dealing with with the unions. Have they asked for more caretakers? So the, there is always a request for more staff, and we are looking at that. How many total requests have you received in the past year from property managers about the number of staff that they need? Yeah, so I, I, Kathy may have that um, answer, but I, I do want to point out that it, it's, there are two issues. I think one is about the current staffing levels uh, and something that we're focused on, but it's also about about how we utilize the current staff that we have. And again, if all 3,000 caretakers work Monday through Friday from 8 to 4, like you can only do so much Monday through Friday from 8 to 4.30. Right? So it's how you utilize those resources. Oh, I, I understand, but I, I don't think you have enough. And I think, so, so the issue is, is that if property <coughs> managers or if folks on, the uh, folks on the ground are telling you we need more additional staff in these areas. How does that information get transferred to those who are in, in a position to make a difference and hire people? That's the question. 
because respectfully, yes, NYCHA has over a $20 billion significant capital unmet need. There's no question about that. Okay. But we're talking about also operations. And respectfully, our city budget has grown from over, uh, when the mayor started, over $70 billion to over $85 billion. So you can't tell me that we don't have the capacity to hire additional maintenance workers, caretakers, to take care of what we can take care of in our developments. Yes, we know the, the, the roofs, that's big work. Boilers, trust me, I know, that's big work. I get that. But sweeping a hallway, <laughs> making sure that urine is cleaned out, out of the elevator, that does not require a union member. That requires someone with a heart and with a nose and two eyes and says, this is not acceptable here. That's what I'm trying to talk about. So does NYCHA encourage a culture to tell their staff on the ground, yes, tell us what you need. We will do what we can. And you're speaking to the right folks here who are in a position to advocate for you to increase your budget. That's what this is about. So, sir, with, uh, before I turn it over to Kathy and to Kerry with respect to uh, the budget, so the mayor and, and the city um, have been tremendous partners and have contributed you know, over $2 billion towards um, NYCHA investments. But that money comes in the form of capital investments. Right? We're not a city agency, so we're not subject to making requests of the city for expense dollars, for, for staffing. Right, that's subject to the dollars that we receive from the federal government. Right? So, so our ask and the mayor's commitment to NYCHA has been on the capital side. Right? Um, but we don't, we, we don't sit at the table um, when it comes time for budget negotiations to talk about expense dollars and headcount. Right? That's not an issue that we have a conversation with the city about. But this so, hearing is about exactly that. And so we're trying to figure out how can we support <coughs> our residents on the ground who tell us that even day-to-day -day basic things are not being addressed. We, we get the big, the big items, we, we understand, and that's gonna require money from Washington, money from the state, and money from the city. I, 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 I get that. But I think we're talking about just basic communication, basic, you know, just workers to resident apartment unit ratios. Uh, last question, is I, I, I wanna be, be very mindful of time, and I appreciate the chair for being you know, very generous with time. Um, are there any resident surveys that NYCHA undertakes to uh, get uh, a feel from our residents directly? C can you share, share that data with us? So, yes, we do uh, surveys on customer service. And so uh, through our customer contact center, uh, we survey... The center uh, that they complain that no one calls them back about? Well, we call them back. We call them back on in uh, in this case to ask them about their satisfaction with work orders completed, right? So we do um, survey that. We also do quality assurance inspections on completed work orders. So we select a number of completed work orders and we reinspect to see if the work was satisfactorily done. Is any of that data publicly available? Um, I do not know if any of the resident survey data is on our website, but we can find out. Because we've heard this now for a number of years, why 311 calls, there's no public record that we can kind of see and view of NYCHA residents. They're not encouraged to call 311, right? Is that correct, that they have to call internally? Is that right? They call the, um, the CCC, the NYCHA complaint line. Right, and, and is, is the data about the number of calls and complaints and satisfaction from follow-up follow from these complaints, is that publicly available somewhere? So, so as of right now, um, that data is not, um, but we do believe that, that indicators such as that um, data um, Why is be. it not publicly available? Uh, it, it, that's a... Yeah. So that, sir, we are looking into making um, all of our indicators much more transparent, right? and I do agree with you that we need to put more information on our website and to share our, our, the information more publicly. I, I would like to make one distinction. Um, it's a customer contact center, so it's not a complaint center. It is the place where the resident calls us to, to request a repair or a service. 
So we don't consider it complaints because, you know, last year we had 1.5 million calls that we generated work orders for. Now, certainly residents do call us because there's problems with scheduling or, you know, the work wasn't satisfactorily done. But just to distinguish that this is where residents call to request services. Yeah. I, I, just a couple of things just to kind of summarize. I think that there is a, there is a serious shortage of basic workers to, to deal with day-to-day -day items. I'm not talking about the, the roofs, but just basic day-to-day -day items. I believe that NYCHA needs to tap into the talent pool that exists in NYCHA right now, and NYCHA should be helping to build capacity within its residents to hire, hire these folks. And there should be, I think, greater transparency about the extents of the issues that we're dealing with. Because everything so far we've heard is about $20 billion in unmet need, capital need, which, which we agree is a serious issue. But we also need to rely more on just anecdotal case stories from our residents. We need to actually see some data and to see if investments are actually working, making a difference. And lastly, there should be a culture of encouraging NYCHA employees to say that if they need help, we respond by giving them help and not giving them some sort of discipline if they speak out. Because the, there are folks who actually care about residents and, and, and their properties who I work with, but they should be encouraged and celebrated that they say, Councilman Traeger, I need more help here. They should not be afraid to make a, make a phone call to say, I, I, I don't want to get in trouble. That's a part of this problem as well. And I thank the chair for her time. I agree. One quick follow-up. How much did NYCHA spend in the last fiscal year on overtime with your um, caretakers or maintenance workers? So I, I believe, and, and if someone can confirm, um, I believe that we spent, um, so last last year we spent $29 million in overtime. 29? No, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, year to date this year we've spent $29 million, and last year we spent $94 million in overtime. No, I don't know that, if that's just for caretaker. No, th that's for all. That's right, for no, the, all. No, I'm sorry, but the council oh. member's question was specific for caretakers. Caretaker. For caretakers. Oh, yeah. yeah, I believe it was either 28 or $29 million, but we'll get you the exact Around $28 million in, in overtime. overtime. Correct. Do you know how much that would equate to um, as far as if you were to hire um, people for those positions, like so, an individual? So, so we have been doing an analysis on that, and I'll be more than glad to share it with you when we're done. Okay. That would be helpful to know. Thank you. Councilwoman Ayala is the last question for the council. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, my questions are really, I want to kind of go back a little bit uh, to the mold remediation work. So I appreciate all of the work that's being done to uh, repair all of the aging roofs that we have um, in the NYCHA portfolio. I know many of them happen to be in my district. Um, but I, I need to understand what the process is after the roof work has been completed for getting back into those apartments and what the timeline is for making remediation um, you know, uh, to bathrooms that are infested with mold. Um, what I'm hearing from my constituents is that oftentimes the roof, was, the roof work was done six months ago and they still haven't seen anyone from NYCHA uh, come in to do the repair work. Um, I think, and I wanted to just as a suggestion, Vito, because I know that you're kind of rethinking how you, you know, how you do things in terms of getting these uh, work orders completed on a timely basis is that one of the problems is that NYCHA will come in and look at the mold and then they'll leave and then they'll send someone in to come in and do some work and then they'll leave and there was supposed to be someone else coming in to do the third part of that process but the onus is on the resident to put in the ticket. And I think that there's no communication between the workers and the residents. So there's not a basic understanding from the residents that that responsibility now falls on them. And there, the process should be that once a maintenance worker comes in and completes part one of that process, that they put into a system that you should have um, that maybe a plasterer needs to come or maybe a plumber needs to come so that the residents are not waiting for months and months and months before the work is done. So, I still want to know, you know, how long it takes before, after the work, the work on the roof is done um, for NYCHA to get into the individual apartments. Sure. So thank you very much. And <clears throat> I, I kind of touched on this earlier. Um, you know, something that, that Kathy and I have been talking about um, recently uh, is, is, is us really in protecting our investments. 
I, and when I say that, I, what I mean is going into the buildings where we have um, invested capital dollars in roof replacements. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as opposed to waiting for a resident to call in a condition to CCC, for us to proactively go into that building um, and to look at the conditions in the units and to make the necessary repairs within the units. Once we've addressed the, the source of the moisture, the water penetration, then it really is incumbent on us to go in and make the repairs in the units. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're working on um, as a plan of action. It's going to take some time. It's not going to be um, overnight. Um, but I, I agree with you 100% that we need to, to do the next step, to take the next step and to follow up. Um, with respect to the, um, the coordination with the skilled trades, um, as Kathy mentioned earlier, um, it's a challenge. Right? And it should not be in, in the responsibility of the resident. That's our responsibility. And that's an area that, that we will improve on um, because I agree with you 100%. Once a resident calls in a condition, um, they should not have to worry about putting in additional work orders or work tickets um, or calls into CCC. It's our responsibility to make sure that the repairs are followed through um, at every step until it, the job is done. And just to add yeah. to that, um, getting to the root cause, to your point, is part of the challenge. So the cleaning of the mold and the repainting is relatively simple steps. But getting to the root cause so that we don't have a recurrence is the challenge. So we are actively now inspecting all of our rooftop ventilation systems to make sure that they are operating properly, that there is air circulation going through um, our, our buildings so that that will help to reduce um, the recurrence of mold. So, you know, there's several levels. There's, you know, work we have to do in the units and be responsive uh, to that. We need to improve the, we call it sequencing the work to the next trade. And that's what I think you were referring to. That should not be a, a tenant responsibility. We have the ability to create those next work orders within our system. So we need to improve in that area and we acknowledge that. I appreciate that because you know families shouldn't have to wait months and months and months to get the work done and they shouldn't be waiting unnecessarily because they didn't realize that they were you know responsible for calling excuse um, me I'm sorry yes. I would also like to comment that um, within our agency we do have a uh, procedure that has been distributed to all of the developments regarding mold and mildew and um, not to say that we have met every single uh, deadline however there is a requirement that staff, once they're notified or they receive a work order regarding mold and mildew, that we are required to send staff to that apartment and we are required to remedy within 15 days. Um, I would also like to make mention is that the borough directors are here and they can speak to it. You know, we meet monthly with our managers and superintendents and the regional asset managers may also meet with them and we emphasize the importance of that when staff go into an apartment that they're required also to identify the root cause of the problem and then also on the work order they are supposed to you know notate on that work order you know what the root cause is because again we don't want to go in send the plaster in to find out that there is still an issue there where the mold and mildew will come back so I would just like to let you know that also we do monitor what we call service level agreements and each of our each of the departments the five boroughs they also monitor the service level, the performance level of every single development regarding if they are adhering to that 15-day requirement. Is so the 15-day requirement a new requirement? Um, no, it's not a new requirement. Okay, then I, I would beg to differ that. In, in the case of developments that are in my district, yes. families are living with mold for years. Right. Um, I personally, you know, have been to many, many, many apartments where it's been evident that no one has come in. And I get it. I understand that we need to fix the root cause of the issue in order to avoid uh, mold from continuing to come back. But in the interim, there has to be a process by which NYCHA is coming in and cleaning it because that's, that's, a, that's a serious public uh, health crisis when children and, and elderly uh, residents are inhaling that. Right. And so 
I, I appreciate that there's a 15-day rule, but it's not being implemented in my district, and I, w I want that to right. be on the record because it isn't. And I would also right. like to make clear, because they did talk about capital projects. So again, you know, let me clarify yes. that again, if the root cause is due to a, say, roof leak, and they may need a capital repair, then that may take a little longer. But in the interim, staff should still work with the resident to try to mitigate those issues in the interim. No, and, and that's, I think we agree on that. I think yes. it's yeah. the, 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 the issue is that they are not. And so how do we ensure that they are? Right. Um, and then, I'm sorry, just a yes. last point on mold. Um, so yes, we, we are taking remedial action and then with respect to the, um, the fix, so to speak. So um, we're in the process of training, um, I believe it's going to be over 2,000 of our staff um, and proper procedures and practices with respect to mold. We've been equipping them with state-of-the-art um, equipment that can help better identify where the moisture is, the source of, source of the moisture. Um, so this is a, I believe it's referred to as mold busters, yeah. um, which is a term that the special master um, kind of coined. Um, but it's a, a process that we're rolling out and we'll be rolling it's out. It's a serious issue. We have 80%, yesterday there was a report, I believe it was in the Daily News, that 80% of, of residents that living in NYCHA are at risk for asthma uh, producing elements, right? And so uh, we, I, I live in one of the districts with the highest asthma rates. And so that seriously concerns me as a mother, as a human being, it concerns me. Um, but I, I, I have, I trust in you, Vito. I know of your work in HPD, and I'm really excited to see you here, and I'm hoping that this is a, a new opportunity to make things right, and I know that you're out there. I've been with you to several of my developments um, to assess, and so I just, I really, you know, I, I hope that, you know, the 15-day the rule is a, is, is a policy that is strictly adhered to. Um, I think another, one of, just of the last uh, comment I think that I would make is in regards to work orders, a lot of my residents are senior citizens. A lot of them are non-English speaking. Um, some of them speak primarily Spanish. Some of them speak uh, Cantonese, Mandarin. And there is usually no one at management that speaks their language that can communicate with them. And there is supposed to be a system by which there is some sort of translation uh, equipment that is provided. I guess you, there's a phone uh, so, process. So and it, it's not usually, so what I'm hearing from my constituents is that uh, oftentimes they're discouraged from using that system and they stand there for an hour and they get tired of waiting around and they go back home. So, you know, they're not, there's no, language is an issue as well in, in public housing. So we're trying to communicate with residents and they don't speak the dialect. That's a problem. So I don't, I don't know what system it is that you use. I have the same issue in my office. I represent a district with a growing Asian population and we don't have, you know, a, per, a staffer on site that speaks Mandarin or Cantonese, but we do use um, a system, my constituent services staff is, you know, is, 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 is advised that they should always be using um, the language access network to communicate with residents so that we know what the needs are. So w with respect to that, council member, um, so both at intake um, at CCC as well as in, in the uh, management offices, our staff have access to language line services. Um, that provides for translation and I believe um, approximately 200 different languages. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the challenges that and one of the observations that I made in going out to, uh, to, the, to the developments um, is that there's some difficulty because we, we have a single handset phone. Right? Um, and so what we um, did at HPD and what we're doing, um, going to be doing at NYCHA is to provide each of the management offices with dual handset phones. Right, and it makes it so much easier for the communication. It's not as if then, so right now our employee has to speak to the translator, hand the phone over to the resident, have the resident speak to the translator, hand the phone back. The dual handset phone allows for an, a clearer path of communication between the employee, the resident, and the translator. I appreciate it because, uh, I mean, I've, I've been at management offices where I'm standing there with a non-English speaking resident and we've been waiting, you know, forever and I'll just stand there just to see how long it takes before someone actually addresses them and sometimes it's a significant amount of time so it would discourage anyone. So I appreciate it, Vito. Thank you.
Thank you, and I know I've said that Council Member um, Ayala will be the last, but we've been joined um, just now by Council Member Richie Torres, who is the Chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee, so I will allow my colleague to ask a question as well. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I saw there was a Public Housing Committee, so I couldn't resist coming. Yeah. Um, Beto, it's good to see you. Um, my understanding is that HUD has imposed a new policy of zero thresholds on the Housing Authority uh, it, it's not clear to me what implications that will have for the capital program. So can you clarify for me what exactly is zero threshold and what's the practical effect on NYCHA's ability to get capital improvements done? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so we were actually disappointed um, when we received a letter from HUD um, rejecting um, our plan that we thought was, um, was a sufficient response to their uh, request. Um, so we're, we're working closely with the HUD regional office uh, to address that. Um, the impact to our capital program, um, we hope that the impact will be minimal if non-existent. Uh, it doesn't mean that we're stopping our work. Um, really what that equates to is that there's an additional layer um, of now for after we pay our contractors um, in order to get reimbursed by HUD, we have to submit additional documentation. Um, there is a review process at the regional office um, where they are looking through all of the invoices. So there is a delay in actually getting money back to uh, NYCHA that we've laid out. Um, as long as that process works and works smoothly, uh, there should be no impact to our capital projects going forward. And what plan was rejected? Um, it was a, um, a corrective action plan that they had requested. I'm sorry, what? A corrective action plan. And what was the content of the corrective action plan that you submitted? Um, was it specific to that? Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. So you wanted to be clear. Um, so it was with respect to um, lead paint hazards. Um, so they had asked for a corrective action plan. We submitted a corrective action plan. They accepted it in part, but not in whole. So the rejection of the of the lead safety. No of the lead safety correction action, action plan led to the, the new policy of zero threshold? No. So what? let me clear. Good afternoon. Yeah. My name is Kelly McNeil. Yeah. Just to clarify, uh, they accepted the corrective action plan um, focused on lead paint hazards. They've asked for a wholesale uh, remediation plan on all outstanding compliance issues with HUD, the regulatory framework, and we await a resolution of the Southern District um, to address that, that the scope of that. And but, so, forgive me. What does that have to do with the zero threshold policy? So, in response um, to uh, the. Um, Excuse me, let me start over. So the zero threshold is a response to the um, resolution not being arrived at yet. A resolution around? Around the, in, the scope of the compliance issues at NYCHA. So, so NYCHA's failure to come to a resolution with HUD around all these compliance issues has led to a new, a new layer of bureaucratic review over your capital program. Is that what you're telling me? That is what I'm telling you, but I am also telling so you why was we, I we, guess are, we, are we are in negotiations. Well, the next the logical District. question is you've been in conversations with the U.S. Attorney for years, so what exactly is preventing a resolution? We continue those negotiations. Um, we look forward to a resolution shortly. And I understand that we've, we've been speaking with them for a while, but um, part of the time has been um, reviewing the documents that we've submitted and having a dialogue back and forth around what the issues are. And so at this time, we are negotiating I mean, you're, you're, a settlement. You're speaking in generalities, or are there stumbling blocks to a resolution between you and HUD or you and, and the U.S. Attorney's Office? Like, what are the, the flashpoints? What are the the issues of disagreement between you and the U.S. Attorney? Um, at this time, so, 
So, um, sir, with all due respect, I think the, the conversations that, that we are having with the U.S. Attorney's um, Office um, are not something that we're prepared to discuss publicly. And, and I understand that, um, Mr. General Manager, but if, if NYCHA's inability to arrive at a resolution is creating a new level of bureaucratic review that is slowing down the capital program, can you tell us something so, so that we uh, know what's creating I, these new sets of challenges for NYCHA? I, I would not say that it's NYCHA's inability. Um, again, there have been conversations um, between the Housing Authority and the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, those conversations are ongoing, and we have not come to a final resolution. Right? Um, and, and I wouldn't say that it was, it's because of NYCHA's inability. Do, do you have a, a timeline for when you will come to a resolution? Um, we have not been provided with a timeline, but we are hopeful that it will happen shortly. And I don't know if my original question was answered, but what exactly does zero threshold mean? Again, it just means a delay in HUD's reimbursement to NYCHA for monies that we're spending on capital projects. And do we know and what effect that's going to have on the expenditure of capital dollars? As, as long as we're getting reimbursement in a timely fashion, it should have no effect at all. And have you been receiving reimbursement in a timely fashion? So the process is relatively new. This is something that we've never experienced before. There are usually other actions that are taken before HUD issues this, um, this mandate, this directive. Um, so we're working out some of the, uh, the challenges, um, but we're working closely with the HUD regional office. Um, as they have additional requests, we're meeting those requests. Um, so again, we were kind of surprised when we received the letter um, just yesterday um, that we thought that we had responded um, to their request. We thought that this would be concluded. Um, unfortunately, um, it's not, so we're still working on that. And in response to your question, have we, our first manual submission, we have received the reimbursement. That was your question, right? Yeah. We, yes. But the, but the ultimate impact of zero threshold remains a question mark. The ultimate. There's potential for it to impact us, okay. but we hope that that's not the case. Every five years, NYCHA is supposed to conduct a needs assessment. Right in 2011, it was found that you had $17 billion worth of capital needs. Uh, five years later, 2016, there was supposed to be a needs assessment. I'm constantly told that it's coming, but it never seems to arrive. So what's the, have you finalized the needs assessment for NYCHA? And if so, what's the timeline for making it known publicly? So it has not been finalized, and we hope to have that done shortly. Do we have a sense of what the number is going to be? Um, I, we do not, but I can get back to you with that. Okay. The, the, obviously, a few months ago, we held a hearing on the heating crisis in public housing, and I expressed concern about the Housing Authority's practice of closing complaints without actually solving the problem. And I pointed out two examples. One is if NYCHA repairs a boiler, the Housing Authority has a practice of closing all the work orders in that building, even though we know there could be causes of, leading, of heating loss beyond a boiler failure. It could be related to insulation, to piping systems. So have you, have you revisited those practices? Have you changed your approach to closing complaints in light of the hearing that we held two months ago? Um, thank you for your question, and we have been very busy um, at NYCHA working on kind of an end-to-end -end review with, with a big focus on the customer service uh, response. So we are um, trying to determine best, best practices that will improve instances where, as you described, where we have a whole development that has had an outage that when we close those work orders, and again, we're, we're talking with our IT folks and our planning folks on how can we assure that every unit had restored um, services. So prior practice was we would randomly visit some units. We, di we didn't have the resources to visit every single unit. So we're now going to try to create a method by which the customer can simply uh, respond to our callback to let us know, yes, service restored, no, I still have a problem. That way we can isolate the smaller number of units that may have some specific issue within their building versus the but entire development. Does it continue to be the case that the repair of a boiler will result in the closing of all the work orders in a building? The repair? At that this, it, that if my understanding so is once we restore the heat, once the, the boiler is resumed to services, right. 
At this stage, that is still what the practice is. But what we and want so you're not going to re-examine that practice. No, that no, that's what we're re-examining. The way the way we communicate service restored is what we're going to change. Right. Yes, that's what we're revisiting. So, and I would yep. also like um, so on the intake process. We, we, I think we also need um, to do better at collecting the information up front. So, if the resident is calling about a building-wide condition, I think it's fair to close um, that condition that complaint um, after resolution if it's specific to an apartment and and we we, no, no. we need to do better and to try to get more information no, but I guess what I, what I disagree with is we cannot equate necessarily equate the repair of a boiler with a resolution of the problem or a restoration of heat like what what NYCHA should do is once you repair the boiler you should send out um, a, a, a call a robocall that asking residents, do you have heat and hot water? That, and if those the, residents yeah. say yes, then you can no, close the work order. We, we, in fact, do that. So is that a... You know, does it work in every situation? Um, it's something that we're looking at, into. Because, again, we've heard complaints from residents um, that the, the work ticket was closed okay. right, um, and that they did not receive a robocall. So we're looking into that, but they should receive a robocall um, I also just want to point out, too, that, and, and again, maybe perhaps it's just a use of the term, but an outage to me is a little bit different. I like to call these uh, service disruptions. Um, and in fact, um, when you look at the total number um, that we responded to this past heat season, 41% um, of the responses, um, they were closed within 24 hours, which means that no. we identified the source of 91%. the- 91% were closed within With no days. no of all the heat complaints that came in um 41 percent of the 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 development wide outages <clears throat> were restored within within 24 hours um, meaning that we identified the problem very quickly and we corrected within 24 hours so if i understand correctly nitro will repair the boiler then send a robocall and if the resident confirms that there is a restoration of heat and hot water, it's only at that point that you will close the work order. Is that the new practice? We haven't designed it yet. That's, what we're, in okay. that's what we're in the planning stage on. Okay. It, so that the that resident will have an opportunity to confirm okay. to your I will just say it's been nearly three months since the last hearing. It seems straightforward. I'm not clear why it's taking so long. Uh, one, one other issue that I pointed out at the hearing mm -hmm. was that NYCHA had a practice of closing work orders without reviewing your own sensors. So you might have sensors that will tell you that an apartment has inadequate heat and hot water, but you will nevertheless close those work orders. Is that a practice that you have re-examined? So if I can first, so with, again, with respect to how, what we refer to as an outage, um, the Housing Authority provides heat uh, above what's required by law, right? um, and in fact, given the, the type of construction of most of our buildings, these buildings do retain the residual heat for quite some time, even after there is a disruption in service. Um, you know how I am, so I've been out to a number of our developments um, where we had reported heat outages, and I went out there with my HPD issued thermometer and took temperature readings, and still found temperatures um, above what the law requires. So when we report a, a disruption or a, an outage, it doesn't mean that the buildings are totally without heat or that the inside temperatures have dropped below the required heat temperatures. And I think that's an important distinction to make. Right? And the fact that, again, we're resolving 41% of these within 24 hours, the building is not going to lose its residual heat that quickly, not within 24 hours. Um, that's the first point. The, with respect to the sensors, um, they're helpful. Right? But sensors also can provide misleading or false information. If a resident is using some type of auxiliary heat right, in their unit, if they have a, a space heater or if they turn their ovens on, which is not recommended, the sensor will give a false reading and it will indicate that that apartment is warmer than, and, and so we need to be cognizant of the but, fact. But I'm talking about the opposite case in which the sensor indicates that the apartment has insufficient heat and hot water. And do you continue to close work orders even though your sensors might tell you that the apartment has inadequate heat and hot water. And I'm not quite sure how many sensors we actually have and when they were installed. Well, it's only a, subs a small subset of the public housing units, right? Right. It's small. 
but even for those units, are we closing work orders without reviewing the sensors? It's a, it's a yes or no question. I don't. Yeah, I don't believe that we are. Yeah, we'll have to get back to you. Okay, and, and I'll end with these questions on, on lead safety. What are the number of units that you've inspected where you've done inspections, remediation, and abatement thus far this year? So we have performed um, approximately 9,000 visual uh, assessments. And of those 9,000 visual assessments- This within, year alone? Um, within, we started. With, we started in the fall. We started in the fall. All right, so we performed approximately 9,000 um, apartment visual inspections. And of those visual inspections, um, it resulted in approximately 7,000 um, remediations. And abatements as well? I don't know if- No, I these are visual assessments, so there's no testing involved. Right, abatement would be upon testing. Have you done any abatements in those units or? Um, within those units? Yeah. Uh, these were, again, the visual assessments resulted in, um, in remediation. Um, I, I'm sure that, um, that we have done some abatements, um, but I'll have to get back to you. But again, it wouldn't be in connection with the uh, 9,000 visual assessments. I appreciate your, your answer, so thank you, Vito. Thank you so much. Um, that actually concludes the questions from the council, and I just want to thank you so much for your um, testimony, and clearly we have a lot of follow-up um, subsequent to this hearing, and um, I really hope that we can work together collaboratively on a constant basis um, before you roll out NGO throughout all of the, the, the developments. And so um, with that, thank you so much for your testimony. And I ask that the executives remain um, to hear the testimony from the NYCHA residents as well. And we have to transition quickly because there is an immigration hearing that's supposed to be held in the chamber. And we were trying to um, be conscious of that as well as a one o'clock um, um, press conference on his steps with EBC and Metro IAF um, related to senior development. So um, I would ask that Danny Barber, the chair of the Council of Presidents, to um, proceed forward, as well as Reverend David Brawley from East Brooklyn Congregations and Metro IAF, as well as Ms. Concepcion from East Brooklyn Congregations, Metro IAF, and Reverend Cruz Jr. and Santiago Sanchez, who will, who will be translating for Reverend Cruz. Thank you. Okay, and just to identify um, NYCHA executives who are remaining, can you please just, thank you, thank you. First we will hear from Danny Barber, the Chair of the Council of Presidents, and then we'll hear from um, Reverend Brawley and then the rest of the panel. Um, and we have two minutes on the clock, but because I know that you're trying to get outside by one o'clock. You can proceed. 
Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, to the fellow council members. Um, I submitted a testimony. Um, I was going to read my testimony, but the council have it. They can look it over. I just wanted to respond to a, a couple of the statements that were made. The general manager spoke of rent collections and not answering personal questions when it regards to employees. This is something frequent that we hear when we come to these council hearings, how NYCHA doesn't want to release anything when it comes to the employees. This was a hearing on property management. What we find out as residents, some of the tactics of property management is the caretakers, the people who clean the buildings are the ones who tend to put the notices of what you owe in rent on your door. So if this is public and private information as it relates to my household, why is a caretaker, a low level employee of the NYCHA Housing Authority being trusted with personal information about residents? That's one. Two, they spoke about how NGO is working and how tickets are supposed to be answered in 15 days. When this program was rolled out under the old general manager, Mr. Cecil House, Mr. Torres, Councilmember Torres, there was, and to Councilwoman Ayala's question, there was a monitoring system where Mr. House had in place with NGO, at the time it was Opmom, where there was a report card where the resident association leader would rate the service of the manager and the superintendent with a report card. These are tactics that we have gotten away from. Thank you for the time. Danny, I have a, a quick question. Sure. So under, under the governor's executive order, the mayor, the speaker, and the CCOP resident yourself are required to convene and select an emergency manager over the next 60 days. <laughs> I think we're near the 30 day point. So can you brief us on what progress has been made so far under that executive order? Now you want the honest answer, sir? I want you to lie to me. Okay. So since you know I'm not a liar, I'm gonna give you the honest answer. The mayor, nor the city council speaker has reached out to us as of yet. We've been reaching out to them and we're waiting. We're waiting because with the executive order, it was to make things better immediately for the residents of public housing. It did away with the bureaucracy. It did away with the procurement, long procurement processes. It would do away with the family, friends, and favors, stuff like that. But no one wants to answer the residents no one wants to sit down and hear what we have to say. So my last statement to your question, the residents of public housing are here to serve the city notice that we no longer will accept crumbs. We are the largest voting block and we will unite, we will gather and we will create our own party to put who we feel into office that will work for the residents of public housing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danny. Reverend Brawley. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Amprey Samuel, to the council. Uh, I'm going to cede most of my time to our leaders who live in public housing, for so often their voices are muted and not heard. But before I do that, I want to invite everyone to our press conference, which will take place in seven minutes, 300 strong. The last time we were here, we were here with 6,000 people. We decided three to 400 would be enough for today. So at this time, I'm going to ask members of our team if you would address this committee. Okay. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Santiago Sanchez, residente de Morris Houses, una de las líderes de la Iglesia del Sur del Bronx y Metro IAF. Cinco años atrás, Mi apartamento por poco me mata. Yo acababa de salir del servicio cuando escuché un sonido muy fuerte. 
Kabum. Corrí a ver. Lo que encontré fue un pedazo grandote de plaster que cayó directo encima del toilet. Si yo estuviese sentada ahí, me hubieran mandado al hospital. O aún peor. No todo, ¿verdad? Sí. sí. Y ha estado pasando tres veces eso. Eh, se necesita arreglar las goteras y, po y poner fin al problema. Y yo seguiré trabajando con los residentes para organizar mis vecinos con las iglesias del sur del Bronx y Metro IF para asegurar que hagan esto por mí y por todos los miles de residentes que están sufriendo de esta misma situación. Tengo fe y esperanza que seamos buenos asociados con el City Council y ganar esta pelea. Gracias a todos. And for those, my name is Reverend Getulio Cruz, Jr. Sure, I'm sorry. I'm Reverend Getulio Cruz, Jr. I'm Pastor Montesión and a leader in Metro IF, and we need to go. But on brief translation, Ms. Sanchez said that in the last five years, her bathroom has been infested with leaks and mold three times. What's more, despite the fact it has been reported, mold is still covering her bathroom today. And as you can see from the picture she showed, this neglect creates very serious problems and helps exacerbate, exacerbate Make asthma worse. Thank you. And just state your name real quick. I'm sorry? And you can just state your name. Tita Concepcion. Okay. Okay. I'm a member of Our Lady of Presentation, Our Lady of, Me Our Lady of Mercy Catholic Church in Brownsville, and a longtime resident of Brook Ellen Houses in Canarsie. I'm a leader in East Brooklyn churches. I'm here today because I need Mayor de Blasio and our city council to fix the entrance doors to my building. We need stronger doors that will not open with a swift kick or pull. I don't want to fear for my safety anymore or the safety of my family or friends. Fear takes over me every time I enter or exit my building because I know there are strangers hanging out in the building, smoking, drinking, and using the stairwells as their elevators, I'm sorry, and their elevators as the bathrooms. I need my doors fixed because I don't, I don't want someone lurking in the halls waiting for an opportunity to sexually assault my daughter again. Yes, again. A few months ago, my daughter was sexually assaulted as she was returning to the building with packages in her hand. She noticed a strange man in the lobby. She adjusted her packages, grabbed her keys in her hands, and went to the door. The man stepped out of the lobby, held the door open for her. While entering the building, she dropped the package. As she bent down to pick it up, the man stuck his hand down her pants. Um, I'm sorry. The man stuck his hand down her pants. She fought him off, and thank God she wasn't I'm sorry. She wasn't hurt further, okay? She should not have had to have gone through this. If we had stronger doors, locks, and intercoms that worked, it would never have happened to her. He should not have been in that lobby, okay? My daughter was assaulted because Mayor de Blasio is too busy talking about fixing housing. Okay, talk is cheap, Mr. Mayor. It's time for some action. Last week, my living room was packed with neighbors who were equally angry about the broken front doors, the lack of heat and hot water for weeks, the power outages, and the floods, and the rats. The rats have taken over my neighbor's buildings. Okay? Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, we are human beings, not trash. We need your leadership to fight for the 2.45 million Billion, I'm sorry, to start fixing public housing from top to bottom. Thank you. 
And that's our testimony, Metro IAF. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Brawley and everyone. And we um, just have to move quickly. We've just been joined by Council Member um, Menchaca, um, who's also a member of the committee, but he's also um, the chair of the immigration and, and they're in the chamber um, right after us and their hearing starts at one o'clock. So we're just gonna transition um, quickly and um, Council Member Menchaca, did you wanna say something? I, all I wanna say is I wanna just lift the leadership up of our chair for public housing, Lika Ampri Samuel, the testimony that we're hearing today is not only important for us as New Yorkers, but it's important, important for us as, as, as we think about the future of our city. That future was in the words of the testimony of that young girl that experienced what she experienced. That is our future. That is what we're talking about. That's why we're here. And just know that not only as members of the, of the committee and the council, but through the leadership of, of council member and chair, Alika Ampri Samuel, we're gonna, we're gonna move this forward in some way. And I hear, I'm here to support her. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have with us uh, Pia Horton from East Brooklyn Congregations as well as Ms. Ramirez, uh, Ramirez from Metro IAF. Do you still wanna testify or are you gonna go outside? Ms. Horton and Ms. Ramirez. All right, so next we'll hear from Lisa Kinner, president of the Van Dyke Resident Association as well as Mr. Victor Bach from Community Service Society. Claudia Cougar, Cogger from Astoria Resident Association. Willie Lewis from St. Nicholas Houses. Audrey Clemens, PS 139 Conversion. Okay, we'll start with um, Ms. Kinner and then Victor Bach and um, go down the line. And then um, we'll, we're asking for about a, no more than one and a half minute clock. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Ken. I am the president of Van Dyke resident association, and I've been a resident at Van Dyke for, it'd be Monday, it'd be 59 years. Um, so I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, one thing I wanna say is, I've been the president for 16 years, and I had seen six managers. And this manager we have now, and they know it, she's the worst. That lady has made my life like hell but I refuse to give up because nobody runs me. You know, that's old saying in Brownsville, never ran and never will, no. But when you are trying to make sure people have a decent place to live and you walk around and see things is not working and you try to explain it to, see one thing I know, we're not, we don't live on a plantation and we don't need overseers. We need people that communicate as human beings. And for the past, three years that this manager been here, my life has been hell. When you try to divide the residents and you got more drama than the people that live there, you can't teach anybody anything. One thing about going, having me going down the court twice for nonsense, I never been a bully, I never threatened anybody, um, never harassed anybody. But when of course I want to see people live a decent life, I got to go through the wind. And you know, Ms. Haywood, I have came to you. I wish Ms. Pendleton was here because I have wrote your several email. Oh, you are here, but you never wrote me back. You never came to see me. I'm a human being. I know I'm over my time, but this has been going on since 
January the 3rd, not, she came January the 3rd, 2015, in the middle. You know, February, February of 2015, sending people letters to come down and pay rent. Some people only owe 50 cents. You sending people, it costs more to put a stamp on there to send that. And then we never notify, we are the duly a body. We never notify. She has her own advisory board that meets at night. I'm still trying to find out what happened to the $1.8 million that we sat at the table to get. What is the breakdown? You know, still haven't got that. But I got harassed. I've been the one harassed. I have, I have people calling my house at night. I have came to y'all. I had called y'all, and y'all still didn't do nothing. You know, I don't do that. I have called. Email, especially email, because you know you got to keep paper, paper trail with y'all. And Ms. Pennington never, never sat down and said, Ms. Kenner, how can I be some service? I'm doing this is free. Y'all get paid. I don't get paid to be aggravated, but that's my home. I'm not going nowhere. I'm going to die in Van Dyke. So it got to look decent. Look how long it took us to get the benches. It took the councilwoman to come over and the um, speaker of the house to come over to see that the benches have been gone since November of 2017 after they did the concrete. She didn't care about people standing up, the seniors have to wait for a cessar ride, or people come home from work and they got to climb up the three flights of stairs. Because to me, you show compassion if you only had put one bench. Don't tell me it's cold. If it was so cold, why you put concrete down anyway? The benches just got down two Saturdays ago, and I appreciate that. I appreciate it so much. People call me at 9 o'clock in the morning, have me put my clothes on, go over there. I had to sit on the bench with them because nobody was sitting on the benches. You can't, and the garbage can. The benches and the garbage can been in the basement since 2016. Thank you, Ms. Kenna. Thank you, thank you, and that we have an announcement. Uh, again, thank you to the chair and this panel. Uh, we originally have uh, uh, a hearing on immigration here at one o'clock. We are moving the immigration hearing across the street to 250 Broadway to 14th floor. We will begin uh, our hearing over there in 10 minutes. So if you want to gather your things, uh, we'll meet you over there. The second thing I want to say is what's happening right now is the power of the people. You have signed up to speak today, and I hope you can stay so that the chair can continue to listen to your voices. <clears throat> that is what our work here in the council is all about. So I'm really happy to be working with the chair to make sure that all voices are heard. The topic at hand for the one o'clock immigration hearing is asking immigrant parents across the city to tell us what the needs are for their kids who are zero to five. That's also an important conversation. Balancing these is our work. Responding to both of these things is our work. So I wanna thank you for being here, be patient. I know there's a long list. Uh, and I applaud all the work that you're doing here in this com before this committee today as constituents of the city. For the one o'clock, 250 Broadway, 14th floor, we'll begin in 10 minutes. Thank you so much, Chair. And, let, and let, let, let's, the speaking to power continue. Thank you. Thank you, Member, um, Council Member Menchaca for your flexibility and your support and um, for being able to do this. Thank you so much for your partnership. Right, thank you. Okay, Mr. Victor Buck. Thank you. Uh, I'll be brief and just summarize our written testimony. Uh, first, we support the uh, citywide expansion of the NGO and Flex Ops uh, demonstrations. We think they've started to prove themselves and with uh, <clears throat> adequate training and uh, uh, changes in uh, 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 labor practices that it would benefit all residents. Uh, but we do think that certain t uh, critical technical operations need to be centralized. <clears throat> In, those would include elevator maintenance, it would include lead paint inspections, it would include boiler inspection and repair, <clears throat> and any other functions that where you have to assure compliance across the board uniformly from development to development. 
Uh, we, uh, we strongly believe that, uh, thirdly, that uh, NYCHA residents should be included in the city's 311 code enforcement system. Um, any, tenant, uh, any tenant in a multiple dwelling can call 311 in a private multiple dwelling and have their complaint recorded, uh, get assured a follow-up by HPD if necessary, and inspection, and if a violation is found, that violation is recorded in the HPD uh, database. We think that uh, NYCHA's uh, conditions need to be externally known and that um, uh, resident access to 311, like any other tenant in the city, is an important part of recording conditions in NYCHA developments. Uh, secondly, uh, to make uh, NYCHA conditions more transparent, we believe that it, we, uh, its exemption uh, from public databases should be removed. NYCHA should have to have its violations, its conditions recorded in the databases held by HPD and the Department of Buildings. Finally, we think that uh, 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 since uh, uh, there will be, it looks like there will be a resident oversight body, um, uh, I think uh, Danny Barber can talk more about that, but uh, we, we think it deserves ongoing support. Um, uh, the nine resident leaders on CCOP have only so much time and energy and they bring differing skills. Uh, we recommend that the resident oversight entity be provided with ongoing staff support independent of NYCHA to enable it to carry out its information gathering and monitoring functions effectively and maintain communications with uh, external advocates and stakeholders. Some portion of TPA funds might be set aside for that purpose. Uh, finally, we think that uh, City Council should call for a detailed NYCHA plan for reform of its property and housing management function. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Audrey Clemens. I am the president of PS 139. I'm here to testify about my relationship with my manager. I always had a good working relationship with all of the managers since I have taken over as president. But there are still many of the same problems that plex us from the manager to manager. Number one, none of them seem to be able to resolve the problem established in office, office with a housing assistant in our building to take care of us seniors. All managers have agreed that this is needed and promised to set it up but it hasn't happened yet. We are part of Do Hamilton management, and we as seniors must go over to them and wait in their office for help when many of us have difficulties. Difficult. Two, adults and small children are living in our apartments. We can identify them, but none of the managers seem to be able to move them out some of us seniors are troubled with the families that are living there when this is a senior-only building. Three, all the managers continue bringing in difficult cultures, but there is no interpreter. Who are we, what are we supposed to let, excuse me, how are we supposed to let them know what is happening if we can't speak, if they can't speak English? No one can interpret China, Russia, India, or any, is there anyone that can put it in their language? We have lots of problems and no manager seems to be able to help. Four, safety and security are a big concern and we are working closely with our councilman, Bill Perkins office, Gail Brewer, our borough president office, there are so many people coming in and out of the basement that, that don't belong here, include homeless people. 
We need better doors that someone can see who is coming in and out. All the managers say that NYCHA doesn't have money for cameras, but I understand that they have a system that they can watch who come in through certain doors and we need all managers to install this system for our safety. In conclusion, again, my relationship with my manager, include my current manager, Ms. Rowe, is very good, but she needs help in getting things for our senior building. She right, she right now is doing a very good job, but we are do, going to remind her that we have a very cold winter and we want to be prepared for the next winter. So we need help now. She need help now. Finish. Thank you. Next. Good afternoon. My name is Claudia Coker. I'm the resident association president for Astoria Houses, Astoria Queens. I'm here to speak on our manager today, but I also would like to say yay and amen to most of the things that I've heard this evening of neglect that's come to public housing, and it wasn't generated. I've been in public housing for 62 years, and it wasn't generated over the past few months or the past few years. I, I've seen the, the changes from the time that I came in to raise my family, and those children now, most of them are senior citizens. But the whole thing about it is I'm on a mission and some people ask me sometime, why are you still here? But I'm here because I love people. And because I love people, my mission is to bring quality of life to those as long as I have breath. But I want you to let you know that the manager at Astoria Houses right now, Ms. Deborah Bon Hennon, is one of the best people that I've met in public housing, in management. She has an open door for everybody. She even give up her personal time to listen and to work things out. The, the thing that I see that she need more of is the actual capabilities, the, the monies and the things that is needed in order to supply what we need. And that's what's missing in public housing today. Money's in the wrong hands, in the wrong pockets. And that needs to be worked on. That system needs to be worked on to make sure that every dollar is given accounted for because we pay our rent for safety, for cleanliness, and for quality of life. Good afternoon. My name is Willie Mae Lewis. I'm a resident of St. Nicholas Houses. I'm a former uh, NYCHA board member. I'm also, I've also been a president at St. Nicholas Houses for 27 years. I'm not that now. I'm here today because uh, we are part of the MAP program. Uh, the doors, they're not locked. The intercoms hasn't worked since they supposedly placed the new doors, which I was told that we were getting seven refurbished doors and seven doors that was new. All of them looked like they were refurbished to me. Um, because we have still have seniors, although our development Furnishing. We have 14 buildings, 1,526 units. Because we still have a lot of seniors there, you know, they're not being uh, properly uh, monitored as far as repairs is concerned. I just visited a senior the other day. I'm a senior myself. Um, she can't even raise her kitchen window because of the garbage that has been thrown out and I don't understand it because we have incinerators on every floor, you know. But it needs to be clean. I went over to the office yesterday with another resident to let them know there are certain areas that needs to be clean. 
One is her, it definitely needs to be clean because she may want to raise her window this summer. We're going to be getting warm weather soon. The next thing is the lobbies. The, our project is 67 years old. We need new lobbies. I looked here on the uh, NYCHA's thing about the property management and all of that, and uh, I see three developments have new lobbies. How long do we have to wait? We have cracked floors in the lobbies, you know, and uh, I want to get, I wanted to save the manager at last. The manager, we need a new one. We need a new manager. I'm not here to, to uh, power down or to throw accusations, but it is what it is. I get complaints, and I'm not even the president anymore, but people know that I have a mouth and that I will speak. They go over to the office, they make complaints, they're talked to, they're talked down like they're not even human beings. That's not acceptable. Another thing that was brought up here today was about having a maintenance worker or a caretaker that lived in your, we used to have that. We used to have caretakers that lived in the building, that lived on the premises, that worked on the premises, that they did their jobs, and we didn't have a problem. Now we don't have people that live there. We don't have enough caretakers. We don't have enough uh, housing assistance. We only have two. We did have a full amount. A lot of people said they left or they were leaving because of managers. Now, you know, I know I work for the Board of Education, and, you know, we all have disagreements from time to time. But when it comes to certain things, uh, like cleaning and what have you, that should not be a problem. And it is seem to be a problem. With the cleaning of the buildings, we have residents that are mopping their own floors. That's also unacceptable. Um, we, I have a lot of stuff here, and I know I don't have but a, a limited amount of time. But um, there's a great deal that's going on. We need more workers, both in the uh, management office as well as on the grounds. You shouldn't have a caretaker taking care of two buildings. We have 14 buildings in every development there. So you mean to tell me they got to take care of one person has to take care of 28 floors? I mean, like uh, Ms. Kerner say, we're not on a plantation these days. They do have unions, and there should be enough people that they can hire. Before they hire them, train them, because we had one young lady, and I said, I don't want to uh, make you not lose to have your job. But she came in my building, she wet the floor, and then mop it. How are you going to wet the floor in the middle of the in the lobby and then mop it? That's not cleaning. We're supposed to be living in a safe, clean environment. And one other thing I want to uh, go on, the cameras. They're just there for decoration because management is not watching them. Because if they was, they would see a lot of stuff that's going on in the, in the residence, uh, in the buildings. The last thing is we just had an uh, election last month. They, there were many violations. The 24 CFR was just ignored. We are waiting still for housing now to give us because we want a recall on the election. It's not that if you be beaten by one vote or half a vote. It's that you go by the rules and regulations of the CFR 24 964 regulations, okay? And that's what they're not doing. Okay, that we have TPA money, they, they claim that we could have paid a third independent person to monitor the election. What did they do? They got two resident association of presidents that live in uh, Manhattan North to monitor the election. We're not accepting that. So even if they don't want to recall, we're going to take this even further. I want to thank you all for, for indulging me in this time, because I could go on and on and on. But uh, thank you so much. And there are some things that need to be addressed in St. Nicholas houses, OK? Thank you, Ms. Lewis. And thank you so much for your testimony today, everyone. And so next, we'll have the panel with Audrey Frazier, Nathaniel Green of Dykeman, 
Jacqueline Frazier of Dykeman, and Diana Blackwell of Fred Samuel. Oh, Miss Blackwell. Thank you so much, and we'll start with you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, I have two testimonies. I'm always doing something for somebody. <laughs> okay, the first one is from um, Ms. Bernadette McNair. She is the president of Wrangell Houses. She says, good afternoon, my name is Bernadette McNair. I'm president of the Wrangell Houses in Harlem. When I was asked to speak, I didn't know what to say, but, I'm, um, but I said to myself, just tell the truth. As president of Wrangell Houses, I prou proudly represent our tenants. And I had the opportunity to work with three managers. I, I must say that all were forthcoming. They were consistently delivered uh, direct dialogue, and I must respect that. Many times my inquiries may not get the answer I want, but there was an open, honest discussion. Do not misinterpret my comments. Wrangell Houses has issues with a lot of common problems that many of the other developments are faced with, such as broken doors, heat and hot water, dog poop, leaks. But with the downsizing of staff, it is not helping our repairs and upkeep of property. I believe that due to the resident association and manager working together as co-partners, NYCHA can improve. Due to the manager and I collaborating, she and I, or the super, are invited to attend our general meetings every other month. This gives the opportunity to meet and hear directly from the residents which they serve. Thank you. That's resident, um, president of Wrangell Houses. Okay, now where do we go? Okay, um, good afternoon. My name is Diana Blackwell. I'm president of Fred Samuel City. Uh, before I say something, I would like to say my manager is here. And I'm very uh, proud to have him sit here. And I've already told him, I'm going to tell the truth, but I, you know, 15 years of a marriage with him, so. <laughs> and like a marriage, there will be ups and downs, but like my parents' marriage that lasted 63 years until his death, they learn to work through everything, and you end up finding out it's not as bad as you thought. Now, in 2009, I became president of Fred Samuel City uh, Resident Association, which was a city development. And in one of my first conversations with my manager, uh, even before I started the, uh, my tenure as president, Mr. Charles actually said he didn't believe in the associations. But in three years from that conversation, he not only believed, but has become our and my biggest supporter and friend. This begins the story of my relationship with my manager. As president, I have an open door policy and many of the residents come in who aren't uh, association members just to vent. Some of the venting is about the manager, so I listen intently to hear what they're expressing and from there I decide whether to speak or write to him to make change or get understanding of that particular situation. He always responds by phone or in person. On issues regarding the upkeep of our failing infrastructure, he has been attentive to complaints, but without a superintendent and assistant manager and other needed staff, he basically works alone. He is knowledgeable and has, come, has good connections and usually gets the needed resources in a timely manner. Still much is lacking, which always leads me to writing to ask for assistance from his superiors. I'm almost finished. 
I hear criticism of him, of him almost daily, and I know that there's a lot of room for improvement. But if the residents will work with the association, no matter who is leading, they can approach him and present their argument or problem and learn how to arrive to a workable solution. Now, having said this, Mr. Charles knows that I have no problem going outside of NYCHA uh, to our local legislators to get help when the solution is above his pay grade. But my goal is to do whatever it takes to raise our quality of life. To conclude, I'll leave this evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses of Fred Samuel's manager, Mr. Charles, which is based on the complaints that constantly come into my office and are addressed to me personally, yet keeps us with a working relationship. His strength, his knowledge is his knowledge of housing system and its appendages. His weakness, his attitude in many of the interactions with the residents. But understand this, sometimes he ha goes by the letter of the law instead of the compassion of the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Nathaniel Green. I'm the Fagman Resident Association President and the Vice Chair for Manhattan North Council of Presidents. What can I say about Dykeman? We are a flex op operation now. I will say that I have one of the best managers going. I'm not saying that because she's sitting right next to me. <laughs> I'm saying that from the bottom of my heart. She has worked with us. We have formed committees within our development. Give me I have more residents um, participating in our general meetings. That's come to the point where our residents cannot even get into the building. Uh, the last meeting we had, we only had two complaints in the whole development. Most of our repairs are taken care of right away. Uh, we form committees that we meet with the manager once a month. Um, I meet with the residents at least once every other month. We take the meetings to the residents in the building. Um, when they have complaints or their repairs, we have a committee that takes care of repairs. We have committees on every level. So when we meet with the manager once a month, all those things are addressed to her. She takes care of it before we meet the next, the following month. Um, we work as a complete family. The caretakers know everyone. If there's a repair that has to be done in the building, that resident on that floor or that captain will notify that resident or knock on the door and say, the caretaker was at your apartment. They will notify the resident association. We will notify the management that that resident is home now. You can go back and get that repairs done. So the majority of our repairs are always taken care of. Um, really, we can say with the heat problem, we don't have a heat problem. Most of our residents say it's too much heat in our development. So we work together like a family. We're trying to get one more caretaker back, uh, Willie that left us, I need him back. My resident is very upset about it. Uh, so we need to keep our family together. And that's all I can say. Thank you. Can you turn your mic on? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Frazier, and I'm the property manager of Dykeman Houses. I've been with the Housing Authority for 35 years. And um, I can truly say that uh, working with NYCHA is not only a career to me, it's a huge part of my life. From the moment that I walk onto the grounds in the morning, I'm looking up, down, sideways, making sure that the lawns are, are being cleaned. I'm making sure the buildings are being cleaned. The doors are locking, the elevators are working. I mean, there's a whole long list that there's heat and hot water. I'm speaking to my staff daily, all day. What's going on? And that's, to me, that's key to providing the services that the residents of NYCHA deserve. You have to communicate with your staff. We're all a team here. As Mr. Green said, we work very closely together in collaboration with each other. And um, I have an open door policy as well. But like I said, the, the, the main important thing is that you have that communication 
and that honest dialogue with each other about what needs to be done, what needs to be approved. Every day I'm walking the grounds. I'm trying to identify something that I didn't see yesterday or something I can approve on for the residents because my motto is if it's not good enough for me, it's not good enough for my residents. So I hope that we can continue our relationship and um, just provide what the residents deserve, clean, quality, safe housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Is Dyke, I know Dykeman is um, um, part of the Flex House program, but yes, are you also is. NGO? Not yet. Okay. Um, not yet, but we're getting there. Okay. Thank you for your testimony. You're welcome. I'm calling Audrey Frazier again, Deborah White, Patricia Tate, and Ronald Topping. Ronald Topping, Patricia Tate, Deborah White, and Audrey Frazier. Oh, Mr. Drumgo. Mr. Drumgo. Ms. Car is Ms. Karma still here? Oh, okay. Ms. Torres. Ronald Chaliwa. Okay, thank you. And we'll start with Ms. Torres. Good afternoon. My name is Ixa Torres, and I'm the president of Alfred E. Smith Resident Association, and we are now incorporated. And I'm here to talk about management. Um, I can sincerely talk about good management, and I can talk about bad management. Um, I now have a good manager. I have a good superintendent. I jokingly tell their supervisors all the time, you can give them a raise or a, a promotion, but they have to stay here. Um, one of the things that needs to happen, I think, to have a good working relationship is that there has to be a respect, but also the resident association, we have committees. Last weekend, uh, I have a grievance committee, so residents came down, manager, and the uh, assistant super came and we did a walk through the development and we actually had a visitor from our councilwoman who walked with us to check the apartments, to check the stairwells, to check what needed to get done. Um, it's about not a got you, but how can we improve? And so um, the relationship has been a working one it definitely a work in progress. We um, have constantly, you know, challenges. We send emails, and we do have issues um, in Smith with the heating, with the water, uh, and things would have probably been worse. But we at least we have a superintendent and a manager who listen to our concerns. They also come to our resident association meetings. They also come to our committee meetings where it's a more close group versus an agenda where they can detailed like when they're real issues. And I know my time is up, but just very clear, I'll give you a, uh, an example. We have our pipes in Smith, and all of them need to be changed, but we have some lines that are worse than others. So by having these committees and having these conversations, they can at least address those issues. But until, like our gas pipes that were totally changed in the entire development, until all the pipes, the water pipes and the sewage pipes are changed in Smith, we will continue to have mildew um, where, leaks because, you know, Alfred E. Smith is 65 years old, like me. I had to have a valve replacement. So all of Smith needs all the pipes changed, you know. But I am, 
really happy with this um, management that we have. I wasn't happy with the previous one, but I am happy. Um, and don't get me wrong, it's not always roses and kisses. We have our moments, but at least there's a working relationship in terms of how our residents are dealt. Because the one thing I do not tolerate, especially for my seniors, is them being disrespected or not treated properly or them not being listened to. That I will not tolerate from anybody. And so we work through whatever needs to be done. And I think dialogue, and yes, we're part of the GEN program, the, the, um, and that seems to work. Footnote, and then I end with this. A lot of the stuff that's being done now is decentralizing NYCHA. The worst thing that ever happened to NYCHA was all the centralization and the 718 number because it's too global. At least when you have it at the management level, then you have a face and there's a communication so that you can resolve the issues and the problems. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to make this real short. Um, I want to first say that Mr. Scotland is one of the best workers in NYCHA. This man is phenomenal. He's, un he's unbelievable. Any time of the night, and I also, if I'm going to say that, then I, will, I should also give respect to Mr. Phil, uh, Carla Drillo as well, because I'll be calling him on the weekend sometime, bothering him and his family too. So, and I want to say that um, uh, uh, his name is Renee. He's one of the phenomenal workers in Brooklyn Houses. So with that being said, Mr. Phil <laughs> uh, and Mr. Horman, uh, to my understanding, I found out today, which I kind of figured out, that there's, now listen to me clearly, because I don't know if you guys know this. I have several texts. There's one Mayton worker that has eight buildings. Those are low rises. There's another caretaker that has four seven-story buildings at 35 people in each building. There's no way on God's green earth that there's going to be able to facilitate us to not having that much of garbage being left over. Those are one of the main reasons why the garbage, and I continuously have to do these new presses. I really want to go away. I want to get on the news and start talking about the good things that NYCHA is doing, which I'm talking about right now. And of course, you all, I don't, you guys don't know, I, I, I fell in one of the buildings. You know, I could have hurt myself pretty bad. Thank God I'm all right. The speedy recover of Mr. Scotland, the next day, every single staircase was done. So I'm asking NYCHA, seriously, seriously speaking, okay, get rid of these two associations that you've been supporting since 2014, okay? Let's get back to the original official Brooklyn Tenants Association, okay? Not the Brooklyn Res Association. And let's get us some 15 more workers. Mr. Sub, I had a meeting with him, Mr. Scotland. They told me, Mr. Drumgo, believe me, you would, have, you would not have 35 to, uh, uh, to 40 calls a day. And, and these people call me 25 hours a day. You know, they tell me to come fix a window. What do we mean, come fix your window? I got 20 Texas right here, just today, sitting up in here. Yes, I don't mind helping these people. I don't get paid for it, but it's not about, it's, it's just in my heart. I just, I'm just asking y'all, do me the greatest favor. Do the people the greatest favor. Get us 15 more workers. Give me 10. I know you gave me workers before, uh, 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 Brian, um, what's his name? The, the, one, the one that uh, retired? Oh, Clark. Clark, Clark, who came out to Brook Island Houses. Yeah, uh, no. So I'm asking y'all, please give us, the 15 workers. One caretaker cannot do eight buildings in equivalent enough of time, okay? Every single day, there's garbage being left over. This has absolutely zero to do with the leadership of Mr. Scotland. It has, to, it has something to do with, we do not have enough of workers to facilitate 30 buildings and whatnot. So please give us what we need. I'm asking y'all very nicely. I'm being very nice about it. I'm being very passionate, please. Can you give us 15 workers? And um, I hate to say this, and I'll go away, because <laughs> that's what we need right now. I've gotten out there myself and helped. Uh, Mr. Scotland, I'm going to tell you, I've gotten out there myself 
you know, and I'm disabled. And we're not. So please give us the 15 workers and give Mr. Scotland a recommendation, uh, I, mean, I mean, a certificate, and, that, and that another young man, Renee, because they do fine work in Brooklyn houses. And no disrespect to Mrs. Hawks and Mrs. Brown just as well. And, we're not. and I thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. John Gold. Oh, good afternoon, members. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Ronald Chalo, a property manager of uh, Carrie Haber in Site 1B, 1,256 units. Um, I think uh, I'm very, very pleased with uh, the job we're doing at the development. Um, uh, recently, uh, I, I could honestly say during the past year, we've made some, some two very big improvements. One is with work ticket reduction, especially in carpentry painting and, um, and plastering. We've, we've reduced the workloads greatly. Uh, <clears throat> we reduced um, plastering jobs from, uh, I think, uh, plastering, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, carpentry jobs from 154 to 90, painting jobs 160 to 63, and plastering jobs 146 to 38. So I'm very, very pleased with that. Uh, I'm also pleased with, uh, with uh, meeting uh, some uh, indicators. Our annual reviews are consistently over 95% last year during every quarter in 2017, and our rent collection <coughs> is, is about 94. And this past month, it was over 100, 100%. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pleased. I have a very, very good relation with my, with my uh, tenants and my tenant association presidents. And uh, I work very, very closely with the supervisory staff. We, we frequently meet. Uh, we, we discuss the, uh, the, uh, the, the indicators. We discuss the tenant needs. Because, you know, one of my goals is to, uh, you know, to meet the tenant's needs, to make repairs in a timely fashion, and at the same time meet the authority's goals. And, uh, y you know, and to do that, you know, it's not easy, but I think we've succeeded pretty well. Uh, I think our indicators are pretty good, and I think that um, you know I get along pretty well with the tenant leaders. I have ver I have m monthly meetings. Uh, we are a Sandy-related development, which which does create some problems. But we are working with the uh, with the tenants to meet with the uh, contractors on a monthly basis. Thank you. Are you an NGO? No. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. First of all, I want to say, uh, Ms. Samuels, thank you for thank taking you. the time to um, not only hear the residents, but um, you're on the ground, and I'm very proud of you. Um, you've been there for the tenants. Um, I come here to say that there are still a lot of problems. We have rallied, we have done everything that we can. We have brought all this to the forefront. Um, but nothing still is being done. All this hurrah, hurrah is all good, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but there's still, there's still a lot to be done. Uh, nothing is being done just this weekend. Um, I have a two-month-old. This is my number 19th grandchild. And we had no hot water or heat on the weekend. And I must say, um, this guy, his name is Dennis uh, Obalio, but um, he works for NYCHA. I call him, and let me tell you, he gets on the case. So I want to give him kudos. Um, also, Teresa, give her kudos. I'm very um, excited about Vito. I think Vito is going to do great things, um, and I just want to, you know, be partners in what we're what we're about to do. Um, I think he has his uh, finger on the pulse. I'm watching him. I love the way he um, expressed himself today, even though Nitra never has answers for us, <laughs> you know, um, and that has to get better. The transparency. Um, in my development, which is Douglas Houses, my main thing is the lighting. I come, last night I came home from a convention, and the lighting is so bad, it's so dark, that anyone could get hit over the head. 
The lighting in Douglas is very bad, needs to be looked at. Please attend to that before somebody gets hurt. I've um, talked to management. Um, my manager, I love him, uh, Mukak, he's, he's on target. My supervisor's on target. But my caretakers are being beaten up. I have one caretaker, which is a woman, in my building alone, is 20 floors. This woman cleans and cleans and cleans. But 20 floors is just too much for one person. I have a lot of women caretakers. A lot of our men caretakers are very lazy. We have to really look at um, the supervisors that supervise the caretakers. Most of them have been on this job maybe too long, 20, 25 years. So they're set on their ways and they're lazy. Need to look at that. There are broken windows. There are in my lobbies that need to be addressed. 868 Amsterdam Avenue. I have a flood in that building every day. Every day. This building is driving me crazy. I get 20 to 25 calls. I am a hands-on person. I go to these developments, I go to these apartments, and I see what's happening. That building needs to really be looked at. These, it's just too much. Um, the management spends more time in 868 than the rest of the 18 buildings that I have. People are literally, literally suffering in 868. I don't know what else to do. I need management. I need 250. I need all of y'all to look at this building. It's only, this building is like my worst. It's my nightmare. Every day. I could be sitting here. I'm sitting here right now. I know there's a flood. And, and this is just unacceptable. We've, um, like I said, we've rallied, we've done all that we can. We've even brought money to you guys with our rallies. But nothing is being addressed at this moment. To tell a resident to call the 707 number is, is just a slap in the face. That does not work. And I'm going to say again, we need an oversight committee of residents to oversee what is going on with NYCHA. We really need an oversight committee of residents, and I'm telling you now, I want to be on that committee. So if NYCHA is going to make a committee, you better look at Carmen Quinones, because I want to sit on that committee. Because it is very important that we know exactly what's going on, where you're spending your money, and how you're spending your money. Right now, I have a, um, in, in, in Douglas alone, we had, uh, uh, we had a budget of $254,000. They gave me a new budget. That budget came out to $89,000. Where is that money? We need to investigate. I know I'm not the only development that they took money from. So if you look at three, 300, maybe 300 residents associations, look at how much fund out their money, TPA monies that they took. Where is that money? I need to know. Because if I had a, 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 a budget of 254, that means that money came out of every apartment from my development. So if you take in the money from my development, I need to know where that money went because it's supposed to stay in Douglas houses. Right now, I have no way, and I've asked, where is that money? Now, add that 320, 300 times in developments, if they took that money. Now, add that up. That's billions of dollars we're talking about that they took in TPA funds, and nobody has an answer? That needs to be looked at, Ms. Samuels, please. Look at the TPA funding. They took that money and nobody knows where that money is. I was sitting on CCOP as a treasurer, never got a treasurer's report. 
Where's that money? Those of, in, in CCOP, when you sit at that, when you are on CCOP, they get money from every development. Where is that money? Where is it going? If you taking my money, I want to know where it's going. Right now, I don't do TPA funds. I've never signed that contract. I don't like that contract, and I haven't signed it. So therefore, I don't use my TPA funds, but they still take 20%. Why are you taking 20% when you ain't doing nothing for me or for my residents? So I really, really need someone to look into the TPA funding that they have taken away from these NYCHA developments. I want to know where that money went. Because that money belongs to my residents. So I want to know where is the money. Thank you so much Thank for your you. testimony. And um, we do have, as part of the series of hearings that are coming up, um, TPA funds and elections will be one of those um, hearings to have a, converse, a deeper conversation about the use of TPA funds as well as how to um, assist in conducting the elections. Okay. Ms. Okay. Malika, um, right. while you're on that conversation. Just find out where that money went because right. that's a lot of money. And, and I, I definitely want to know about that because um, then maybe we can get our car changed out of the wrong association name, you know, because this is a totally different uh, EIN number. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll make sure yes. that we follow up yeah. and include you in those call. conversations. Yeah. But thank, never, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so I much. I appreciate Thank's your one. time and your, oh my God, and your work. Thank you. You have a fan. You highly appreciate it. This is family. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm a fan of your glasses. Please look at <laughs> my lighting in Douglas, please. My lighting is very important. It's too dark. And I bust my butt. Lord help that's that's it. I think we have two more. I don't see Mr. Bowman here, Mr. Reggie Bowman, and Zaqual. He's outside. This is Dennis, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Dennis. I think that's it. Even on a weekend, you got yourself a winner right here. Thank you, Papi. Gracias. Duly noted. Everyone loves Dennis. So that concludes our hearing on the oversight of NYCHA's property management, and I look forward to the follow-up in the ongoing conversation in partnership between the council and the New York City Housing Authority. Thank you so much, everyone. My lady, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Okay, I'm yeah. going to go Thank you, thank you very much. Let me say hello to my lady.